Barrett Jackson rocketed into 2023 at Scottsdale with an auction for the ages. And now we head to the East Coast with a supercharged lineup to celebrate 20 years at Palm Beach. Headlining the auction will be the incredible collection from Steve Todd Hunter, including two of the rarest Mopars you've ever seen. And history will be made with the sale of the first production Chevrolet Corvette E-Ray. But that's just scratching the surface. Supercars, muscle cars, resto mods, classics, convertibles, trucks, whatever your heart desires, we have you covered. And it all starts right now on FYI. Welcome to Florida and the world's greatest collector car auction, Barrett Jackson. We're back here at the South Florida Fairgrounds and ever since the doors opened first thing this morning, folks have been flooding through the gates, looking forward to a great auction. And boy, once they get through, what a great opportunity to see a great collection of cars. More than 600 that are going to be crossing the block over the course of the next three days. Every single one of them selling at no reserve. And what a great collection of cars we've got. I mean, yeah, of course, we've got Ferraris, we've got McLarens, Ford GTs, but we also have some fun stuff. You know, we've got VWs, MGs, even a Pinto that's going to be crossing the block in just a short time. And of course, when you've got such a diverse collection of cars, well, you need a crew that has automotive knowledge that is deeper than the Marianas Trench. And that's exactly what we have with Mike Joy and Steve Magnante. <laughs> Thank you, Rick, and hi, everybody. Thursday at Palm Beach is the most eclectic day of any Barrett-Jackson anywhere. I guarantee at the end of this telecast, you will be saying at least once, well, I've never seen one of those, there are two Studebakers, there are three Corvairs, a coupe, a convertible, and a ramp-side pickup. You just missed a Miata for $5,000, and not just a Pinto, Rick, but a Pinto Squire will cross the block in the next hour. Remember those, Steve? I sure do. You know, if you live long enough, cars who were just going by in traffic become collectible. And we're starting to see something new. Cars from the 80s and 90s and even a little newer becoming what Barrett Jackson calls modern classics. And they're starting to really uh, increase in value. And with reference to Rick's Marianas Trent's reference, we're going to dive deep and show you what these cars are all about. And starting with a Chevy Monte Carlo, but not what you think. Monte Carlo, of course, usually rear-wheel drive. These are the modern ones with front-wheel drive. Better yet, it's an SS. Yeah, front drive, but this is still the idea of a uh, two plus two businessman's coupe. And they race these. Okay, they race cars that look very much like these. In NASCAR, two great success. And Chevrolet had a lot of special additions uh, on this Monte Carlo during this run. So as an SS, you see it has added body cladding. It has aluminum wheels, uh, bucket seats. So at least a little more pizzazz, if not a little more power. We all know, of course, that SS started out in 1961 as a super sport, and by this point in time, the 3.8 liter had about 200 horsepower. $7,000, the very first vehicle we've seen cross the block and sell here at Barrett Jackson, although they were selling cars for a full hour before we came on. A lot of fun cars that have been crossing the block. Rolling up behind it, a 2006 Mercedes Benz CLK 500. This one's a Cabriolet. So this came in two versions. This was uh, the C-Series is Mercedes small car and the CLK or uh, coupe light. This is the uh, convertible version with the V8 and with the AMG styling kit and wheels added. No added horsepower, but uh, this V8, consider this kind of a 2006 version of what Pontiac could have done with the GTO. Big V8 in a small body, 94,000 miles on the clock though. Yeah, in my book, any car with a V8 and rear-wheel drive, I don't care where it's from. It's a muscle car, or it can be. These are certainly a lot of fun to drive. And, uh, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, a V8 and a Mercedes was a very rare thing, generally an inline six or a four. But by this point, the V8 was mainstream. And I dare say, certainly a future collectible, if not a current collectible right here. 
This one is triple black with some very nice burled walnut inside. That is the stock presentation. Note the buttons on the steering wheel for these added controls. Mercedes was one of the first to pioneer that uh, just a little bit before this car was born. Sure makes life easier. Remember, too, that uh, for every 10 or so hard top two or four doors, maybe one convertible was produced. So the convertible is always the rarest body style. And that one just sold here at Barrett Jackson for $7,000, the 2006 Mercedes Benz COK 500. Let's check in with the next member of our broadcast team, the host of Hoovy's Garage. Here's Tyler Hoover. Well, I'm with Lot 106, which is one of the many examples here in Palm Beach of the incredible customs they have at Barrett Jackson. This one started as a 1977 C10, and it's the little touches I like, like the bottle opener here mounted to the bed. But you also see the tie downs there, the cow heads. That's a sign of things to come when you go into the interior, which if you look at this it's a lot of raw cowhide in there not just leather but the real raw cowhide this thing was treated to a beautiful frame off restoration a laser straight body but definitely the coolest finishing touch is under the hood take a look at this LS engine here all the Edelbrock bolt-ons headers everything else but one other touch since it was frame off you can see they even powder coated the frame there black and gold to match the rest of the truck this thing is immaculate and I love all the fun touches. And once again, this is entry level day here at Barrett Jackson, the first day of the auction. And we're going to see a lot of fun things crossing the block like this. I love this. A 1953 Ford Custom Line. It's a police car recreation. Well, it is a recreation. It is a V8. And of course, 1953 was the second year for this styling cycle, which debuted the flying toaster rear quarter panel motif, which is uh, either a flying toaster or the, uh, the force of a locomotive going forward at high speed. But anyway, dual exhaust, of course, on this one. And Ford did lead the market in what they call police interceptors. If you were a police department in the 50s, you needed a fast car, you got yourself a Ford similar to this. Remember the TV show Highway Patrol? This is what it reminds me of. And I think back then they, they were using Buicks, at least in the open of the show. But this Ford, the way it's done up, boy, I can just see him going, you know, talking you know, on the radio and having that TV show. It was great back in the late 50s. You see the Motif custom line on the front fenders. There's the custom line in the main line. This would be the base model, which is typical of a police car. Well, $10,000 for a pretty cool piece of machinery for that 1953 Ford custom police car recreation. We're going to check in with the next member of our team, April Rose. Hey, Rick, I'm under one of the many, many tents here at Barrett Jackson. Such a beautiful day, but it gets even better when you're standing one when you're standing next to one of these sweet girls. 1987 Buick Grand National, the last year for them, all black on black, the ultimate sleeper. They're not a show off until you check that out. Turbocharged and intercooled 3.8 V6, 700 R4 speed automatic. Now, check this. At the time, they were America's fastest production cars. Faster, actually, than a Ferrari F40 at 0 to 60. Now, I want you to see, peek inside that two tone mouse fur. Beautiful Turbo 6 logos on the headrests. Just a super boxy 80s look inside. Man, there's nothing wrong and everything right about a Grand National, Rick. April, you've got a thing for those Grand Nationals. One of these days, you're going to have to raise a bidder's pass so you can take it home. Look forward to seeing that car up on the block. Well, as I mentioned, we're going to be here for three days. Today, we're live until 6 p.m. Eastern time on FYI. Tomorrow, we're back for seven hours, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time on FYI. And then on Saturday, all day on the History Channel, 11 a.m. Eastern to 6 p.m. So we look forward to make sure we'll see you for all three days as more than 600 cars cross the block here at Barrett Jackson. I'll tell you what, absolutely beautiful day out of McGuire staging lanes where all the cars are getting ready to come up onto the block. Rained an awful lot yesterday afternoon, but today, once again, just a few clouds out there. It's great, nice and warm, exactly what you want for spring break and, of course, the Barrett-Jackson Collector Car Auction here at the South Florida Fairgrounds. Up at the block right now, we've got a 1998 Jaguar XK8 convertible. This one's been well enjoyed with 72,000 miles on the clock, white with tan interior and tan top, four liter V8. These were close to $100,000 new, so somebody's going to get quite a bargain here. 
remember, too, that this plays into the styling of the original E-Type Jaguar of their early to mid-60s, which were inline six powered and later V12s. But again, Jaguar discovered the wonders of V8s into the 1990s. And yeah, there's a V8 under the hood here. Of course, this was right before the matchup between Ford and Jaguar. Ford, I think, purchased Jaguar in 1999. This is 1998, and it just sold for $5,000. And as they put on the sold sticker, we're going to check in with the final member of our broadcast team. Here's Christian Murphy. Thank you very much, Rick. I'm up here with the men who run the show, Craig Jackson, Chairman and CEO, Steve Davis, the President. Gentlemen, a nice little milestone, 20 years in Palm Beach. Craig, what makes the collector car hobby in Florida, Palm Beach, in the area, sort of special and how have you lasted 20 years? Well, we first chose Palm Beach. We wanted to do an East Coast auction and Florida seemed to be the right answer. We looked all up and down the East Coast and the car community here is very strong and getting stronger all the time. There's several different automotive country clubs here, a new track down in Okalaka. So the, the car culture here is strong. You go to a Cars of Coffee here, it's a thousand cars. So supercars everywhere down here. It's been a great venue for us. Also, just the lifestyle that you have here in Palm Beach lends itself for everybody wanting to come and vacation down here in Palm Beach and make it part of their Barrett Jackson tour. Yeah, well, the enthusiasts have come out, a good, strong room. Steve, 20 years of dockets at Palm Beach. How have you seen it change over the years? And what is the flavor of a Palm Beach docket? Well, in 20 years, we were just reflecting that a minute ago with Craig. Uh, from the very first time we set foot on this site, and fast forward to 20 years, what an amazing journey. 625 cars. Of course, that's what's different, number one. We didn't have anywhere near that at the first auction. It's grown, and that's really kind of the sweet spot for us this year. We, we talked about we can go a lot later, but, but everybody kind of likes to leave a little earlier. This, this, uh, so, so we cut the docket off to be right around 6 o'clock. So every number is prime time. With incredible response, so, so much so that we turned away a lot of cars. That's also what's different. The first year at Palm Beach, first couple, two or three years, you know, you're kind of getting your footing. We've, we've taken it over. We've done what we do. People love it. They look forward to it. And it's just the cars, but it's the experience. People come all over, from all over the world to enjoy Palm Beach. It's been a little rainy the last couple of days, but it's going to clear up for us this weekend. Uh, just the excitement, the overall ambiance of Palm Beach. Like Scottsdale, it's unique to Palm Beach, just like Scottsdale's unique to Scottsdale. Well, Vegas is Vegas. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, storm clouds have cleared up. We're set for a, a wonderful couple of days. Well done on getting us to the start line. Thank you very much. I'll check back in with you at the end of the day. Absolutely. Back to you, Rick. All right. Thanks a lot, gentlemen. We appreciate it. Up in the block right now, we got a 1979 Cadillac Fleetwood, currently bid at $17,500. Well, this is the uh, third model year for the downsized Cadillac. Yeah, 1977 brought downsizing to Detroit as the uh, OPEC oil embargo kind of gave uh, Detroit a wake-up call. So is that, uh, this is a downsized car. It's still as full-size as it can get. That one, that one looks showroom fresh with just 54,000 miles. It came out of Greer, South Carolina. The way that one goes, they'll put the price on the sold sticker, and we're going to check in with Tyler Murphy. I'm with Lot 51, a 1991 Nissan Figaro, and with the Blueprint Engine Cam, let's take a look under the hood here. It is a mighty one-liter turbocharged four-cylinder engine. You heard me right, one liter, like a bottle of water size, but you can see the engine here, and then there's a little turbo next to it, which has a heat shield, and then another heat shield up on the hood to protect the paint. Now, you may have never seen one of these before, and that's because they were never sold in the United States, the Nissan Figaro, but if you look at the body, it's very retro-inspired here. So to look kind of like a Fiat 500. They call these the K cars, very small Japanese cars uh, that are getting important to the U.S. a lot thanks to the 25-year rule. They're exempt from federal mandates to where you can bring them in. Fun little rag top or tracks back, but also really cool retro styling. I love these. All right, thanks a lot, Tyler Hoover. We appreciate that. Look forward to seeing that up on the block. And there right now is a Porsche 924 S. This is about the least expensive way to get into a P car right here. These four cylinder front engine cars shared a lot of their running gear with the Audis of the day. And this one has the automatic transmission, a three speed automatic that will hold the number back here. But uh, these are very capable cars. Yes, you'd rather have the 944, but that would be thousands more. 
if you squint at this, it looks a little bit like it's Big Brother, the 928, and that's purely intentional. But remember, the 928 was about 20% larger and had a V8 under the hood, not a four-banger. Well, the way that goes, I think we got a couple of those we're going to be saw seeing crossing the block over the course of the next few days. And the Summit Racing Soul sticker goes on, and away it goes for $14,000. Actually, pretty fun cars to be able to drive away in. 2006 Mercedes Benz CLK 500 Cabriolet up on the block. Well, deja vu all over again. One crossed the block very much like this uh, in triple black about 15 cars ago. This has the AMG styling, the front bumper uh, with these, the grills and uh, fog light situation like so. And these are all four seaters, not five. Bucket seats, front and rear. They're all automatic transmissions. But when you put the five liter V8 out of the SL in one of these, as has been done here, uh, you've got kind of a, a junior supercar. Now there's 128,000 miles on this, and that may hold the number back because it's been well enjoyed, but still, very sharp car to cruise in and plenty of power. Beautiful design on the interior of this. The rear seats almost look like an art installation. Bucket seats holding you in place. Certainly uh, sporty in the, as much in the back seat as it is in the front. And you talk about the horsepower, 302. I mean, you've got to remember back in 2006, 300 horsepower was pretty solid for a car like this. So not just enough get up and go for its day. I mean, yeah, we think of 300 as you know, kind of entry level today, but back then it was, it was a solid number. One interesting detail is we noticed that both exhausts come out the driver's side. In another couple of years, Mercedes would understand and appreciate the symmetry of left and right exhaust outlets. But that's what you've got, the dual pipes there on the five liter. $7,000 for the 2006 Mercedes-Benz. All right, coming up in just a few minutes, we're going to see a 1960 Pontiac Star Chief sedan crossing the block. It's got a 389 cubic inch engine, 283 horsepower under the hood. The color Palomino Copper Poly. The all-new line of Barrett-Jackson merchandise and apparel is now available. From road rallies to the office, there are many stylish options for the car lover. Available year-round or online at shopbarrettjackson.com. Welcome back here to the South Florida Fairgrounds. Barrett-Jackson, the world's greatest collector car auction. Already into day one of our three days of coverage, and up on the block now, a 1988 Alfa Romeo Spider graduate. Well, the term graduate is seen on the front fenders on those logos. Of course, a reference to Dustin Hoffman's character in the 1970 movie with Anne Bancroft. I think the graduate invest in plastic. Mike? That's right, plastics, uh, Benjamin. These cars started in 1966, and they had a great run all the way to 1993. I had a 67, and I had a 91. And they were great cars with a five-speed, all-synchro, five-speed, four-wheel disc brakes, dual overhead cam, engine, synchro mesh on all five gears. They were ahead of their time when they were introduced and still very capable sports cars when this one was built. Well, that one just sold for $15,000, making that the number three sale of the day so far, although I think the numbers are going to slowly but surely edge north and get a little more expensive. Now, if you'd like to test your collector car knowledge and perhaps grab a great prize in the process, you're going to want to play Fantasy Bid, brought to you by Dodge. All you have to do is go to promo.barrettjacksonfantasybid.com to register and play. You'll try to predict the winning bid of some select auto vehicles, auction vehicles that will cross the block on Saturday, April 15th. The winner at the end of all four of the 2023 Barrett Jackson auctions will win the grand prize. It's a 2023 Dodge Charger. And if you're really on top of your game this week and you can predict the exact final bid of all 12 Fantasy Bid vehicles, you could win $100,000. It's called the Perfect 12 Jackpot. So make sure that you register to play. Terms and conditions apply. You have to be 18 to play. Remember, visit promo.barrettjacksonfantasybit.com for the official rules. Up on the block now, it's a Rolls Royce from 1982. This one's a Silver Spur. This is uh, the spur, of course, is a long wheelbase with more rear seat room, longer doors in the back. And again, this is before Rolls-Royce rediscovered the allure and marketing value performance. This is 6.7 liter V8 with maybe 250 horsepower. But again, large and in charge. 
Yeah, this was the most luxurious car on the road, to be certain. Uh, that big V8 was mated to a three-speed turbo hydromatic transmission sourced from General Motors because nobody did automatics better uh, than GM at the time. Uh, this beautiful car in 1982 would have been close to a six-figure price tag. It'll be a bargain today. Yeah, Seventeen thousand dollars just what it hammered sold for and we were talking about how the cars differ here in Palm Beach. That's a perfect example. We'll see a few more of those. And as he signs the paperwork, we're going to check in with April Rose. Hey, Rick, this is glorious. 1980 Pinto Squire station wagon. Now she's all original, a true survivor, just taking all this cool foxwood all the way down the side. Man, that is so neat. Okay, 1980, it was the last year for the Pinto. It was replaced, actually, by the Ford Escort. It's got a 2300cc L4, three-speed automatic. You've got to check inside. Just take a peek at this Vaquero cloth, and the back seats do fold down for extra storage. Cool green details on the gauges. Man, it's all original. And you got to check out these hubcaps, also the original ones. And this, is, this always cracks me up. Back here, this tailgate opens up with the tiniest little handle right here, man. Rick, I would totally sport this. Do you think it's all me? Absolutely. I mean, you have to remember how many people were driven around in those things who are out here in the auction world today. Ford had a Squire version of everything, including the Ranchero with that Dynock wood down the sides. That's great. We'll see that up on the block before too long. Right now, we've got a 2008 Land Rover Range Rover. This is a Sport HSE model. Hard to imagine. This is almost 20 years old. I remember when these came out. This is one of the first muscle SUVs. It's all about the HSE supercharger and 390 horsepower. And going back to the point we were making earlier, you know, that 2006 Mercedes that had 302 horsepower, good for its day, 390 in 2008, really strong horsepower. This one's just broken in, 57,000 miles on the supercharged uh, Range Rover Sport. And the HSE is quickly identified by the front fenders, have these gills behind the wheel opening, and that's where you can quickly identify these away from a standard Range Rover. $13,000, the final price for the 2008 Land Rover. And as they get a chance to take that vehicle away, we're going to go away for just a moment here at Barrett-Jackson in Florida. Well, before the auction begins here in Palm Beach, we have to have a real party. That's right, the gala, the Barrett-Jackson party that takes place in the exact same room, the same building as the auction. And center stage, well, in addition to Craig Jackson, it was that beautiful E-Ray, that Corvette that's going to be auctioned off, the VIN 001 first production Corvette hybrid. But it was all about fun last night. That's because today it's all about the cars. And what's crossing the block right now? How about a 1968 Ford Fairlane 500? Well, don't call it a Torino. This is the Fairlane in its first year for this styling cycle, which only went two years. Yeah, this uh, the Fairlane was getting kind of big, uh, close to the size of the Galaxy here. Now, those numbers are vinyl. You can remove those, and I think somebody just got a bargain. I tell you what, a lot of fun stuff crossing the block, interesting things that are selling at good prices, prices a lot of people can afford. $9,500 for that one right there. Don't forget Barrett-Jackson.com. That's where you can see the full list of cars that will be crossing the block during the course of our three days. Maybe dream about what it is you'd like to buy and take home. And with the prices we're seeing on the first day, because once again, it's entry level, there's a lot of fun stuff that you could enjoy in your garage. 1994 Ford F-150 pickup truck. Well, pickup trucks are heating up, literally, and every generation seems to be getting love, including the more modern ones. But the reality is, this is 30 years old. Looks new to me, but again, it's 30 years old, and people are starting to like these, and I get it. Well, this one's had a refresh and a repaint, and it certainly looks much better than the 130,000 miles showing on the odometer. It's the one you want. It's the short uh, standard cab, short bed. It's had a mild lift, uh, custom wheels added. But uh, very nice paint job and refresh on this one. It does show a Carfax accident, and that's not necessarily a problem at some point in the past if the work was done well. And this looks like it's been nicely restored, so I'd say no problem there. 
Yeah, this is one of those that's crossed over that Nexus line between where it was just a used vehicle and now it's going into what we're considering the modern classics. Cars that people grew up with in the 80s and 90s now appreciate and want to buy, like that gentleman right there. $12,500 for a 94 Ford F-150 pickup truck. All right, from a 1994 Ford to a 1992 Chevy, this is a C-1500 custom pickup truck. Well, like the uh, square body Chevy pickups, these also came with either two or four headlights. This is the base grill. The upscale would have four lamps here, but again, this one's been customized quite a bit. The flames, the visor, the little spoiler on the top, the running boards, all these things were classic mail order items back in the day, and they look okay to me. Yeah, painting that grill in a secondary color and carrying that color up into the flames over the hood and fenders, that's what you'd see on the cover of uh, sport truck magazine, trucking, and the like back in the early 90s. A lot of add-ons here, running boards given to it, and only 2,000 miles on this since the restoration. Got a 5.7 liter crate engine, which is good news because the original motors in these were maybe 200 horsepower. Of course, the aftermarket engine is probably marked 350, and that's more like it. Step bumper added and locking tailgate, which is a kind of a nice thing to have if you want to make sure your tailgate is still there when you come back out uh, from wherever you've been. I like the dual exhaust, full length, and by this point in time, factory dual exhaust was not a thing, so when you see the pipes coming out the left and the right-hand corners of the rear, you know there's a little more power on board. The two-tone theme is carried through to the interior as well. We'll get a look here. That uh, copper and white, this would have had a tan interior originally. $15,000 for a 1992 Chevy C1500 custom pickup truck. Wide at grill, the beautiful flames, and away it's going to go to a brand new owner. Got some great cars coming up later this week. In fact, we're going to check in with the director of consignments for Barrett Jackson, Mike McCullough, for a Shelby he is looking forward to watching. This is the 2020 Shelby GT500. This is the carbon fiber track pack. In 2020, uh, this car was known as the golden ticket car. You had to be someone special. You had to know somebody uh, to get one of these cars. This car is finished in performance blue. Uh, what's really unique about this car is it has the $10,000 option painted on white stripes. You could get the vinyl sticker stripes for about $1,000, or you could pony up and get them painted on for 10 grand. This car has that option. These are the most impressive cars Mustangs built to date. Craig. I love them. Just an absolutely amazing car. Seven speed automatic transmission. Yeah. That thing can shift faster than your brain can think to shift. So they're just absolutely impressive cars. Yeah, that's a good point. Those automatic transmissions, computer rated, shift so fast. You think you could do it faster, but you can't. 2003 Mercedes Benz CL55 AMG. This was about the most expensive Mercedes you could buy other than its twin in SL V12 form. This with the five liter V8, a five and a half liter V8. This was the Executive Express, 500 horsepower in these. These were fast and fun. Uh, 493 horsepower. I like how Mercedes pays tribute to their own history, the 1930s SSK. Of course, K stands for compressor. We see the logo compressor on the front fender with a K, yep, German for supercharger. $14,500 for what once was a very, very expensive car and now is an absolute great highway cruiser for somebody. 1992 Chevy C10 1500 custom pickup. Well, I love two-tones, but this takes it to a whole different level. Uh, this custom creations conversion, and I believe this is all paint. I don't believe any of this is a vinyl wrap, and it's got a beautiful fade going on here to the solid color, to the testerosis side stripes. Uh, what a beautiful job they've done here. It's interesting to see that GM brought back the step side pickup bed for a brief period, seen right here, narrower than a wide 
side pickup, but this one does have something unusual under the hood. This has the 4.3 liter V6, which might have 160 horsepower. So a heart transplant down the road, and this one wouldn't be a bad idea. So we were talking earlier this week about how to define the modern classics. And I think we're going to go with from the late 80s to the early 2000s. And this is a perfect example, right in that 1992 range. If you were born in the 70s or the 80s, these are what you grew up with. Now, this little V6 was three quarters of a small block Chevy 350, but it was one of GM's first fuel injected V8s. So this 4.3 put out nearly as much horsepower as the 305 V8, and it was, well, one quarter lighter over the nose. Interesting engine. I had one in an S10 Blazer, did just fine there. Notice these strakes on the doors, very reminiscent of the Ferrari Testarossa, and for a while that was the thing to do, paint some strakes on the doors, even if it's just paint. Well, $10,500 for a 1992 Chevy C1500 custom pickup truck. And don't forget to tune in to our Super Saturday coverage at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on the History Channel, whether you're a true history buff or you just tune in for episodes of your favorite series, The History Store is your one-stop shop for exclusive and official History Channel gear. Shop now and get your piece of history at historystore.com. Up on the block, how about a 1976 Chrysler New Yorker? Well, this is the right, exact right car at the exact wrong time. I've got a YouTube channel called The Junkyard Crawl, and about a week ago, we featured a 75 New Yorker Brome. This is a massive car with a 440 under the hood right at the time that gasoline doubled in price. Sales on these things were weak, and the only thing that saved Chrysler at this point in time was the Cordoba, which was about 70% the size of this. But with that said, this is a massive Front rear-wheel drive, American barge. Beautiful example, a survivor here, but these used to be basically worthless in the 1970s because they only got 14 miles to the gallon. Today, they're coming on strong, and I get it. I wonder if this was the car for somebody's summer home because it only has 63,000 miles. The Spanish gold paint is original, and so is the medium gold velour interior. No rich Corinthian leather here, Ricardo Monobaum. Uh Look at those pillows uh, from that really nice gold velour tuf uh, tufted pillow interior. And this one being in 1976, we'll have Chrysler's dreaded Lean burn ignition, <laughs> which is not a bad thing, but the computer was mounted on the air cleaner, right where it's in the way of heat and vibration, so they didn't last long. So if you have a lean burn Chrysler, you might want to swap it out. But again, this one's very original, down to the single exhaust. And these, many cases, had catalytic converters for the first time in 1976. Now, 214 inches long. It was a beast of a vehicle. Not quite at the longest Cadillacs, but very, very long. $7,200 for a 1976 Chrysler New Yorker, and we're going to take a quick break, but we'll come back to Barrett Jackson in Florida. Consign now to join the world class collector vehicles already in the lineup for Barrett Jackson's 2023 Las Vegas event. June 22nd through the 24th in the West Hall of the Convention Center. Sell your car where the bidders are. Barrett Jackson on some exciting news recently. We are headed to New Orleans this year. The three day auction will take place September 28th to the 30th at the New Orleans Ernest and Morial Convention Center. You know, nobody does it better than Barrett Jackson and combining that with a great city like New Orleans, it should be something really, really special. We can't wait. We're looking forward to it. Maybe we'll even see you there. Up in the block right now, a 1978 Corvette Pace Car Edition. Well, this and the Cadillac Eldorado 1976 Bicentennial Edition are probably Detroit's first two self-aware collector cars. That means that the New York Times were writing about these cars as instant collectibles, and a lot of people bought these things, put them in bags, and assumed and hoped one day they'd be worth a lot of money. It kind of played out, but this one here is in very uh, desirable configuration, the L82 224 engine. And again, the graphics on the side were not applied by the factory. You put them on at the dealer level, but again, a very crisp presentation here. And those graphics are vinyl. They can be removed if you choose. Only 25,500 miles. Sir, sir. 
Well, I'll tell you what, that is now the number one sale of the day easily on day one. Not sure if that'll last during the course of the day, but so far, $27,500 for that 1978 Corvette Pace Car Edition. As I said, the prices we expect them to change because we got plenty of cars out in the staging lanes. It'll be coming up in the block before too long. And, you know, we talked about the beginning of the broadcast. What a great variety. I mean, there's a Volkswagen. We got a Corvair up in the block now, a BMW. This one's from 2011, a 750Li. Well, this was the top of the line. Uh, the 7 Series in long wheelbase form. With a 4.4 turbocharged V8, 400 horsepower, this is a car you could drive or you could be driven in. Uh, this one with sport seats, uh, very highly optioned, very nice car. Yeah, the L in 750LI stands for Lange, German for long, as in long wheelbase, more backseat room. Plenty of leg room for even my six foot two son. Uh, and his sister back there. He's had the BMW iDrive, which uh, testers for the magazines didn't like because it does take a little learning and getting used to. But by turning a knob, pushing it, pushing buttons, you could do a lot of things on this car without taking your eyes off the road. And it became a very popular and useful feature. Debuted here. This is the, this is the updated version without the bangle butt. The Chris Bangle was the head of BMW styling, and not everybody liked this in its first guys. This was much better. Well, fun fact, back in the mid-1980s, the BMW 750iL V12 car was the world's first drive-by-wire passenger car. General Motors bought a bunch of those things, and the C5 Corvette arrived with drive-by-wire. Not that they copied it, but again, they evaluated that for sure. But again, no wire connect, no mechanical connect between pedal and throttle body on the LI of the 1980s. Fun facts. Yeah, and as strange and new as the iDrive was in its day, now so many cars have some variation of that. Well, they thought they had it hammered sold at 95, and somebody jumped in at the last second at $10,000. And away it goes. That's the price for that 2011 BMW 750Li. We're going to check in with Tyler Hoover. Well, lot 58.1 is a very special Trans Am in 1987. GTA. Multiple reasons why it's special. First, a GTA, the Gran Turismo Americano. They wanted to make these more of a European competitor, but also they finally gave the Knight Rider body a little more horsepower than it really deserved. Got the tune port injection, sort of from the C4 Corvette, except with iron heads. Of course, the IROC Camaro was much more popular, but this one's the same motor. I like the GTA better. This body kit is awesome. The honeycomb wheels down there, very 80s. And then when you go inside, the interior treatment is just very cool as well. But what makes this one really special. This one only has 9,000 original miles. So it's basically new in the wrapper, a time warp. If you love these GTAs, if you're a child of the 80s, this is the one to get. There were a lot of people at Pontiac at the time that wanted to call this a GTO, but that name had so much street cred, there was a lot of pushback, and GTA was the result. Got to compromise when you need to. $10,700, the current bid on the 2003 Mercedes-Benz SL500 Roadster. Not sure I understand that, Rick, because this one has only 35,000 actual miles. So uh, it's been treated to some aftermarket wheels. Uh, been well enjoyed, but not too well. It does report that there was some damage to the front, minor damage, though. So if it's been repaired properly, and I'm sure it has, and back out on the road, it's a pretty nice car. And I go back to when these are working right, they are a great cruising vehicle. $11,500 for a 2003 Mercedes-Benz SL500 Roadster. We're going to stay in the Mercedes-Benz world, something a little more modern from 2012. This is a CLS 550. This uh, was a new style for Mercedes. A coupe-style sedan uh, is what they called it. And they brought it out to great fanfare, and it was great. Uh, for well-to-do families with, uh, let's say, young teenagers or, you know, grade school age kids because they'd fit well in the back. Not a lot of headroom in the back because this was more about style than being a full-size sedan. But, boy, it looked the part, and with all of this AMG option package, it went, too. Nice car. 
100,000 miles on the clock, so still plenty of life left in this one. And it's been well cared for. The body on this uh, looks all but showroom fresh. Dark tinted windows, as you'd want to have here in South Florida. Very pretty car. Yeah, honestly, you show up in front of the restaurant, they're going to park you out front with a valet. I mean, it's a nice looking car. I mean, realize we're less than $20,000. Once again, only 100,000 miles. Beautiful. That diamond white, meta white metallic, not easy to do. Uh, Mercedes, of course, does it very well. I love the fact it's got over 400 horsepower, plenty of power to get you going. You're going to feel when you put that throttle down, you're going to feel the power surge forward. Really, it's a great sweet spot for horsepower. $18,000 for a 2012 Mercedes-Benz CLS 550. All right, rolling up behind it is a car that uh, April Rose previewed a while ago. It's one we're all looking forward to seeing across the block. It is a 1980 Ford Pinto. This is a Squire station wagon. We got to remember the Pinto was Ford's. These cars have been taken care of. They've been absolutely loved, and they are up for sale at no reserve. One of the very few cars today from the Boyd collection. We'll have some tomorrow as well. Pay attention. Great opportunity here. All right, here. 1970 was the year that Detroit finally responded to the subcompact threat imposed by Toyota, Dots, and Volkswagen with things like the Pinto and the Vega. Not a bad little car for its time. Kind of antiquated, rear-wheel drive, very American in many ways. But these sold fairly well for a full decade. In fact, I drove one of these for about 30,000 miles in Los Angeles, and I'm still here to talk about it. Well, I've driven this one. This comes out of the Boyd Collection in North Carolina. It was sold new in Minnesota. Said to have 9,000 actual miles. My son's put a couple hundred on it, laughing all the way. Everybody has a story about Pinos. And like we said, they did a Squire version of everything, even the Ranchero. And that Vaquero cloth upholstery, you just, you just can't find this in today's cars. Is that a good thing? I don't know, but it sure is distinctive. Well, and the reason everybody's got a story about a Pinto is because they made so many. I mean, they made more than three million total Pintos. These little Pintos are one of the sleepers in the market right now. Every time he shows up with, with low miles, people go crazy. Here's an opportunity. Very few of these left in this condition. This is a squire with a good gray, absolutely incredible car. Great collection by the Thomas. Well, you know, Ford brought back the Bronco and the Maverick. Could Pinto be far away? It's possible. It had a decent reputation once we got past uh, the first couple of years. Well, they're close to dropping the hammer. We're up to 12,500. When's the last time you saw a Pinto Squire? Right? And that'll do it for our first hour of live coverage right here on FYI. But guess what? We are just getting rolling today. We still have another four action-packed hours to go. Welcome to the world's greatest collector car auction. This is Barrett Jackson, Palm Beach. What a collection of cars, more than 600 crossing the block over three days, every one at no reserve, like this 1980 Ford Pinto Squire station wagon. Well, kicking and screaming, Rick, we've got this up to $14,500. They're even bidding up in the skyboxes. Uh, show me when you've seen another one. Very desirable low mile car coming from an incredible collection. Five, fifteen. Nice thing about the Pinto wagon is that these were two doors, which kind of checks the box with hot riders and customizers, whereas four door wagons are kind of frumpy. And yeah, Dotson and Toyota did make four door wagons on this small scale, but with the Pinto, it kind of looks right. 2.3 liter, four cylinder overhead cam, automatic, about 25 miles to the gallon. And as we've said, where are you going to see another one? Back in its day, the regular Pinto, the sedan, was a pretty successful showroom stock C division racer. They were pretty competitive. Well, this one just sold at $14,000 for a 1980 Ford Pinto Squire station wagon. What a great, great car. Rolling up right now, a 1960 Pontiac Star Chief sedan. We gave a quick preview of this just a little while ago. 
Well, we noticed on this one how wide the wheels are apart. That was Pontiac's wide track styling. And in fact, these actually have about three inches wider track, the distance between the drums, than a Chevy or an Olds or a Buick. Pretty close to Cadillac territory. And again, GM's wide track marketing program lasted well into the 1960s. It starts right here. The distinctive split grill of the Pontiacs was still one year away when this 1960 rolled out. This was kind of the end of the jet age styling with the tail lights up proud of the rear quarter panel. Pretty, pretty car. New paint, new interior, wide white walls. Boy, this is this is 1960, isn't it? And this one is a four door hard top, not a sedan. And what's a hard top? Well, that means when you open the doors, there's no fixed pillar on this one here. We can see the back door also open. So when the doors and the windows are down, you have a full air effect. That's a hard top. So we call these flat tops uh, because the roof is essentially flat and also because uh, the tail end of the roof line did not end at the top of the rear window to create kind of a fastback. It actually uh, came proud of the rear window by about uh, by about three inches. A little, little extra, little bit of shading there. What a great style. <laughs> Almost had it sold at twenty-one thousand dollars. Then another bid came in. We're up to twenty-two. There goes $22,000, making that the number two sale of the day so far behind that 1978 Corvette pace car edition. Well, right behind it, check out this Nissan Figaro convertible, and it's time for some Haggerty Fastbacks. This is lot 51. Once again, it's a 1991 Nissan Figaro convertible. 1991, in fact, was the only year of production, but they made just about 20,000 of them, and every single one of them, because they were sold brand new in Japan, are right-hand drive. These were called the Pike Avenue cars. There were five different styles built at the Pike Avenue plant. There was so much demand, Nissan had to have a nationwide lottery for who would be allowed uh, to buy them. There were five different body styles, all very retro. One was called the S-Cargo, uh, you know, snail-like, as in how fast does that S-Car go? But this one was just, imagine the Ford Retro Thunderbird. Well, this is kind of it in uh, Japanese style, 1991. It's true, you know, the Volkswagen new Beetle was new at around this time, but it wasn't just a German thing, of course, retro styling. This is about the epitome of it right here, right down to the Fiat 500 style foldable center roof. The sides are rigid for rollover standards. They're safe. However, the fabric roof can be extracted, and it's an open-air car. Beautiful retro styling. Looks like 1950. I remember Auto Week had one of these when they were new in the U.S., uh, their motorsports editor, Steve Potter, let me drive it at Michigan for a day. And But now, since they're 25 years or older, anyone can import them without having to convert them to current EPA and DOT regs. And they made about 20,000 of them, and I've seen quite a few here in the United States so far. Let's check in with April Rose. Hey, Rick, I'm in the pre-staging lanes. Beautiful day out here. The sun is shining, the wind is blowing, and I'm next to this beautiful 1985 Firebird Trans Am, and I love the look of this long, low, swooped down hood. You got the pop-up headlights, no obvious grill, and these really cool air vents up on the hood. Now check out the raked back windshield. You got T-tops and this hatchback rear end with massive window, just a very cool look. Now she's got a tune port injected, five liter, 700 R4, four-speed automatic, and take a look inside. You got that mouse fur cloth, and the screaming chicken on the headrests. And all the rage back in the day was that AM FM cassette stereo with the equalizer on it. It's just such a sweet ride. What do you think, Debrule? I don't know. Mouse fur cloth is not something that sounds attractive to me. 2009 BMW Z4 convertible up on the block. Oh, this one's a beauty. Deep sea blue with ivory interior. A uh, wind blocker here separating the roll bars. This has the DSG. A transmission so the automatic computer control shift it yourself or use the paddles. I'm 
not sure of the mileage on this one, but it looks as if it's been very well kept. These were hard top convertibles. There was no soft top. The hard top in three pieces came down. It reduced the trunk space, but it gave you that security when that top was up of an enclosed car. These were expensive new, Rick. Uh, this is a 35i. The IS would have been the top of the line. There was also a four-cylinder version, but this six-cylinder was over 50 grand new. Well, now it's $15,500 here at Barrett Jackson for a 2009 BMW Z4. Pulling up behind it, a 2004 Mercedes-Benz. This is an SL500 Brabus Edition Roadster. So Brabus is kind of the German version of Shelby. They modify Mercedes. Uh, they do it very, very well. This has a bespoke front bumper cover uh, with fog lights and turn signals down there uh, at the base of the air dam. It has some very deep dish three-piece wheels, some added body cladding uh, front and rear, and this one showing uh, under 40,000 miles. Just remember, too, that Brabus also had a tuner version of the smart car, which I happen to have a smart car. Not a Brabus. I wish mine was. But they had 90 horsepower versus 60. And the Brabus edition of the smart car is kind of a little pocket rocket. Another hard top convertible. Uh, which became all the rage in the early 2000s. The new Mercedes SL just launched, has a soft top, as do BMW's convertibles. They were hard top convertible for a while, but now they're back to the traditional convertible soft top. You know, I think the Brabus modifications to this cost almost as, as much as is currently bid. Well, away it goes, and the Summit Racing Soul Sticker goes on, and it sells for $19,000. And with that, we are going to take a quick break here at Barrett Jackson Palm Beach out here at the South Florida Fairgrounds, where what a collection of cars we're going to see crossing the block over the course of our next three days. Stay with us. Beautiful time to be here in Palm Beach, enjoying the great weather and the great cars. Up in the block right now, I love this one. It's a 1955 DeSoto Fire Dome Custom. Well, this is 1955, the first year for Virgil Exner's forward look styling. It really was a revolution for Chrysler Corporation. Love the two-tone with all that gleaming stainless separating the purple metallic it did not wear originally. Uh, from that bright white on the roof down the sides, torque thrust wheels, uh, nice piping in the interior, carrying through the two-tone theme. $19,500 for that custom 1955 DeSoto Fire Dome with a rebuilt Hemi engine. Congratulations. Looks like he's pretty happy to come away with that. All right, go back to 1966. Time for a Volkswagen Beetle. Yeah, the original small car, 1949 onward, millions of these were built globally. And uh, these used to be, well, throwaway cars. But again, great, clean examples are very collectible. And here's one right here. And Volkswagen had a great ad agency. The headline in the ad magazine ad was Think Small. It was just a picture of the car and then a, a description of its features. So this one has a 1300cc flat four engine, four speed manual, a red over gray, the original style wheels and hubcaps with an add on aftermarket luggage rack. Tell you what, I like this a lot. Got the right look, and this is a good year to buy it. 1966, they had a big bump in horsepower. It was about 40 horsepower in 65, and 1966, it went up to 50 horsepower. All right, won't blow you away, but you think about it, it's a big jump, 25% in horsepower. While the Beetle kept the same shape, there were things that grew over time, like the size of the taillights to meet regulation, 
and the size of the rear window. This is the big window car. I'm not sure if this was 65 or 66 was the first year for the big window, uh, but it was very close to it. Original Beatles, you got only a speedometer. By now they had a gas gauge too. The gas, when you want to fill up your gas cap, you go under the hood till a couple of years later when there's finally an external filler flap. $19,000, solid money for a 1966 Volkswagen Beetle. Let's check in with Tyler Hoover. Well, how many of you all watching back home grew up with one of these, a rear-facing third row in the big American family station wagon? But this one's the last of the dinosaurs. It is a 1994 Buick Roadmaster Estate wagon, and they put a lot of cool tech in this thing, actually. You see, it opens up two ways, the rear tailgate, this way, and then as a normal tailgate, I actually owned one of these uh, for many years. Drove it to both coasts, brought my oldest home from the hospital in a 94 Buick Roadmaster like this. But you look down the sides here, it's one of the last to have the wood paneling. Of course, that's faux wood vinyl grown from the finest plastic trees. Interior pretty rare with this burgundy pillow top leather. But then under the hood in 1994, they went pretty special with these. And the engine, it is the LT1. Yes, the Corvette-based V8, so it actually had some horsepower as well. These things from 1994 to 96 with the LT1. And then the Great American Station Wagon was no more. This is truly the last of the dinosaurs, and I love these. All kinds of great things out in the McGuire staging lanes right now. What a collection, what a variety of vehicles. And once again, you got Corvairs, you got big pickup trucks, and you got great looking station wagons. All to be up on the block before too long. And right now, another Corvair. A 63 Corvair Monza convertible, $17,000, the hammer price. All right, you already saw one Porsche 924 cross the block earlier today. Now it's time for a second one, a 924S. As the first one, this is a 924S in guards red, which had to be the most popular color of these. Formerly owned by a PCA member. There's a decal here in the window, and generally, Porsche Club of America members are much more fastidious about keeping their cars in great shape and keeping the provenance and all of the paperwork and everything that goes with them. So I hope this one is uh, is that way. Five-speed transmission, Blaupunk stereo, a lot of fun to be had here. Notice the wheels on this one. That's what we call the telephone dial style wheel. First debuted on the 928 in 1977. And of course, the styling on this is basically 7 tenths scale 928. But again, we don't have a V8 here. It's an inline four. And also, no transaxial here. This is a normal transmission behind the engine, unlike the 928's transaxial in the back. But again, the styling is there about 80% of the performance right here. Maybe right, so here's the big number 21,000 miles. That's all this car has on it. Yeah, this, this is a beauty and I think a great, great deal at this price. The spoiler on the deck of this is actually pliable rubber, and that's to conform to European pedestrian safety standards. I won't push on it because sometimes when you're this old, you can dimple them, but this is a rubberized treatment here, but it's in great shape after all this time. Yeah, less than 22,000 miles, $19,000, the hammer price for a 1987 Porsche 924S. You know, the great thing about Barrett-Jackson is not only is it a great variety of cars, but it's a great variety of people who come and enjoy these events. You know, some of them guys, but plenty of them women who enjoy their cars. And here's April Rose to introduce us to the Leadfoot Ladies. One of the great things when you're at a Barrett-Jackson auction is you're surrounded by people who love cars. Now, my favorite thing is women are starting to take over, and I want you to meet Tiffany Goldberg, who is doing just that. She started an exclusive group called the Leadfoot Ladies. Tiffany, tell me how you started this group. I was a child racer and in go-karting. I was the only girl on the track, encouraged a few girls to get involved at a young age um, and felt the pressures of what that, that was, um, what that meant to me. Um, I later in life joined in the manufacturing realm on the back end of the builds and uh, got a car, a uh, sports car a few years ago. Once I got back to Arizona, I was like, you know, we need to have more women showing up because it was intimidating. So about over a year and a half ago, we started the Leftfoot Ladies. We just want to be able to encourage and get more women from young ages of all stages and all kinds of tracks out there, you know, getting involved. We 
try to cultivate a culture of positivity and empowerment. There are so many more women that are out there hitting the track. I've just been surprised at how many of us there really are, and now we're just encouraging more to come together. And how do you find women to be part of the Leadfoot Lady? So far, we've been a bit of a secret society as far as the core club. Um, who are really involved, are working in the industry. We have a few that are out there in the bidding, uh, one sending one over the block right now. Um, and we just organically seem to meet in these spaces and it's like a magnetic attraction because there aren't a ton of us. We wanna encourage to keep building on that. Tell me about the events you go to. Just about every weekend, there's multiple events across the valley here. Um, most of us wouldn't go before we had each other. Uh, so now we are full in the charge and showing up every weekend together. How many women are part of the Leadfoot Ladies right now? Right now we have about 40 of us here at our core, but we do encourage and invite women from anywhere to be joining us. So today we had the pleasure of welcoming women uh, driving their supercars from Texas and California. And we like to share and spread the news of women all over the world who are doing the same thing and are enthusiasts and, and know cars as well. That's right. We don't need men anymore, right? Men are becoming obsolete. Well, wait, just, just kidding. We have a spot for you yes. in the passenger seat. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Don't need men anymore, I guess, did you ever? But I mean, you're a perfect example. I mean, you're a car lady. You like El Caminos, you like Buick Grand Nationals. You love, love cars. It. I love them, I love so many cars. You know, it's such a great thing. A lot of times I'll be driving and everyone's like, oh, watch out, woman driver, woman driver. But we don't want to hear that anymore. And Tiffany Goldberg is proving that point. These are beautiful women driving beautiful supercars and I love to see that. Yeah, it's not just for guys. And we see plenty of women in the crowd out here in the bidder section right. it's buying cars. There's no shortage them out there, so, not just for Rick, guys. Rick, here's my question. Who's a better driver, men or women? Uh, women, of course. There you There's go. No that's, way I'm going to go wrong on that's that. That's the right answer. answer. All right, let's talk about the car that's up on the block. It's a 1987 Pontiac Trans Am GTA. This is the car that Tyler Hoover introduced to us just a little while ago. Yeah, the GTA is the big dog, 5.7 liters, no 5.0s here. These are always 350s, always uh, automatic equipped, but that's okay. Four-wheel disc brakes. This was the top dog Firebird Trans Am until you got into the Turbo Trans Am of 1989. But this is a street killer, 13-second car on a, a sticky surface. Less than 10,000 miles on the odometer, closing in on the number one sale. We're at $27,000. Will it make it? No, so close. Just $500 away for a 1987 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am GTA 27 grand. Sign right here, and it's all yours. The all-new line of Barrett-Jackson merchandise and apparel is now available. From road rallies to the office, there are many stylish options for the car lover. Available year-round or online at shopbarrettjackson.com. Things changed quickly moments ago. A 1979 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am, 403 cubic inches with a V8 auto transmission. Across the block, looked great, and it sold for a strong number, $35,000, meaning that is now the number one sale of the day for the first day. And let's take a look at the Haggerty Top 5 Sellers, brought to you by Haggerty. And of course, we have th two of the top three, which are now Pontiac Trans Am. We got a Hummer in fourth and a Corvette in second. I love that car in fifth, that Pontiac Star Chief at $22,000. And once again, as the day goes by, we can expect all those numbers to change. 1956 Chevy 210, it's a two-door post up on the block. So it's the mid-trim level in the least expensive body style, the two-door sedan. This is in original condition. This is original paint. You can see where it's been kind of polished here to within an inch of its life. Gleaming, beautiful two-tone here. Power glide uh, transmission, two-speed automatic. Original uh, flooring, which is not carpet uh, on these 210s. It's kind of a rubber flooring. And we're still going. 
Yeah, this one is a V8. You see the dual pipes coming out the back. The 265 in its final year for 1956. $25,000 for that 1956 Chevy 210. Part of the Boyd collection. All right, a very different kind of GM product from a different decade, 1994. This one that Tyler Hoover previewed, a Buick Roadmaster wagon. We got to love these cars, the rebirth of the great American station wagon. Now, the big thing was, at this point in time, other Buick wagons were front-wheel drive and could only haul as much as 2,500 pounds. These are full-frame, rear-wheel drive cars. So if you had a 5,000-pound trailer, you could pull it with this and nothing less. And the roof line here is a nod to the Buick Sport Wagon of the late 60s and the Olds Vista Cruiser, uh, where it's kind of a humped sky roof here with the uh, integral luggage rack. Plenty of room here for the family. This is bucket seats uh, and a middle bench, so that's five. You put three more kids in the back, and you have filled it up. Alloy wheels, Dynock wood vinyl trim. They don't make them like this anymore, and they probably never will. You gotta remember, there's about 200,000 Roadmasters built. About a third of them were wagons. The other two thirds were four door sedans. Again, big family cars. These are popular with people 50 and older who I can relate to at this point in my life. I love the rear window wiper for convenience. Of course, the centrally mounted brake light, standard stuff after 1985 on all American cars. One family owned. Well, and away it goes at $22,000, that 1994 Buick Roadmaster wagon. You know, we have so many great moments at Barrett-Jackson at each one of the auctions. And last year, here in Palm Beach, there was a real special vehicle that sold for a great reason. In fact, it touched everybody in the room. People, please be generous. Whatever you can do, uh, please help the people of Ukraine. Thank you. Now, what's important is that one bid gets both of these great cars. We're at half a million dollars, $600,000 bid. Folks, you're getting both of these cars, and every time you walk outside, every time you look at these, think about what it represents. The cars are great, but it's the cause we're here to celebrate. And a million dollar down a and a million dollar down a One million is bid! Let's hear it, ladies and gentlemen! Sold! Sold! There we go! One million dollars! The generosity of my Barrett Jackson customers and family overwhelms us. This is a great cause, touches everyone's heart. These people are fighting for their lives. Thank you. Yeah, now that was last year. We're gonna see some great cars selling for great causes here on Saturday, so you're not gonna to wanna to miss that, including that new Corvette E-Ray that'll be crossed in the block. Cool car for a great cause. Up there right now, a 1996 Corvette LT1 convertible currently bid to $18,000. This is a fourth generation Corvette known as the C4 seen here in its last year. But the good news is under the hood, the tune port injected 350 gave way by this point in time to the LT1, which had 300 net horsepower, which sounds like not a lot now, but it was a big deal when this car was new. Way it goes, $19,000 for the 300 horsepower 1996 Corvette. Goes up to somebody in the sky blocks. All right, from a 1996 Corvette to a 1974 Corvette. White with black upholstery and uh, red interior. Paint looks to be original, but uh, kept to a very, very high standard. This is an automatic transmission car, however. Yeah, at this point in time, the uh, fifth digit of the VIN tells you what you have. This one's a J-code, the base 180 horsepower, 350 under the hood. No, you know, no great shakes. Uh, big block, 454 was final year, 50, uh, 74. And again, no catalytic converter until uh, 75. So this is the last of the non-cat-equipped Corvettes right here. Now, this is a two-top car, but note the roof treatment here. This is the removable hardtop, but it is finished with a vinyl covering, so it's a vinyl top so that it looks like a convertible, and if you take it off, well, it really is a convertible, so, okay. And 
and these cars are, at, at the time, they were fairly advanced, four-wheel disc brakes, independent rear suspension, but again, those disc brake calipers were iron, the rear suspension parts were iron, <laughs> so again, uh, a, sort of a modern approach with older materials. Well, this one just sold for $14,000, that 1974 Corvette, matching numbers, 350 cubic inch V8 engine with an automatic transmission. Congratulations to those folks right there. All right, let's talk about a Datsun. We haven't seen these in a while. In this case, it's a 1982 280ZX Turbo. And this one's been treated to a number of additions, most notably the uh, Perspex headlight covers filling in the sugar scoop. Third generation Z car. You know it's a turbo by this NACA duct uh, here on the hood. T-tops and uh, slats on this one and spoilers galore. Yeah, the good news here is the five-speed manual transmission. You could get the turbo with an automatic, but not here. When you always, when you saw the wheels and that turbo emblem on the front fender, you knew you had a, a boosted 2.8-liter inline six under the hood. Now, later on this week, we will see a 1970 240Z, the very first year. And, of course, uh, the 280ZX scene here it has the same styling, the big fastback, but, again, a much larger and pretty much heavier car. The replacement for this was even larger. Yeah, the sports car fanatics thought Dotson had kind of gone off the wide and deep end and spent too much time at the buffet when they designed this one. It was wider, it was longer, it was softer, and it was heavier than the original Z car. But then again, so was everything else in that day. Yeah, but it really opened the market for the Mazda RX-7, which came in and kind of took that lower level. It was a little smaller, a little simpler than what these had become. Let's not forget, of course, the Toyota Supra, which was Toyota's answer to the Z car. In fact, on my YouTube channel, Steve Mag's Junkyard Crawl, we explored a Toyota Supra. But again, this is the large turbocharged Z car right here. $20,000 for that 1982 Datsun 280ZX. Barrett-Jackson.com. You see the cards here. If you want to get a full description of them, the same thing you see on the car card, you just go to Barrett-Jackson. That's where you can get the full list of cars that are going to be crossing the block. Up in the block right now, we got a 1985 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am. This is the one that April Rose previewed a little while ago. Yeah, this one's pretty cool. This is a T-top car, of course, but this has the WS6 option, which means four-wheel disc brakes, which could be had on a Trans Am as early as 1979. But again, WS6 means enhanced suspension, wider rims, better tires, better springs. But again, under this hood is the 5-liter 305 tune port injected small block, which is essentially a Chevrolet engine, but no harm there. And that TPI engine was quite an advance because the intake runners were tuned to length and the fuel injectors were actually in the manifold right near the entry to the cylinder heads, one for each cylinder instead of throttle body injection, which has just one injector uh, back there at the butterfly. So uh, a TPI engine like this, much more efficient, able to make more power and able to be more fuel efficient as well. Yeah, these third-generation F bodies, as they're called, the Camaro Z28 and the Firebird Trans Am, are starting to come on strong with kids who wanted them as young people in the 80s but couldn't afford them, uh, who now can. And here's a great example, very much bone stock, no modifications. This is how you want them right here, bone stock. Well, and this is cool. It's got the original dealer paperwork. It's got a finance contract. It's got all the original paperwork that it came from the dealer with. So it's really kind of a time capsule car from 1985, very original looking without original paperwork. Hammer was up for a while, but they wanted to make sure $12,000, the winning bid for that 1985 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am. All right, coming up, something a little bit smaller, a 1967 Otto Bianchi Bianchino wagon. I love this. I saw it out in the uh, staging lanes. Restored just a little while ago, four-cylinder motor, $3,000 in repair receipts. Welcome back to Barrett Jackson in Palm Beach, and we're going to head right out to April Rose. Check out this 1965 Cadillac DeVille. This is a survivor, never been restored. Now, in 65, they had a bit of a redesign, more angular look, and they got the stacked headlights to make room for this 
massive grill, and I love the turn signal indicators right up front there. Now, this piece has the 429 three-speed automatic, and inside, you got room for like 20 people. Go ahead and check that out if you have enough friends for that. And it has an interesting roll-up crank windows for the vent windows. Just a really cool look all around in that powder blue. And I want you to check out these fins in the back because they just melt right into the body where in 64, they still flared out. I mean, I kind of miss them, but this is just over 18 and a half feet long. I mean, this is a land yacht. Rick, tell me the truth. Would she fit in your garage? I'm not sure if my garage is long enough. There's a reason I own an Isetta, you know. I, I want it just a little bit shorter so I can get the garage door down. Up on the block now in 1995, Pontiac Firebird. This is a good one. It's a Formula SLP Firehawk convertible. Indeed, the Firehawk logo indicates this has been modified by SLP, which is Street Legal Performance of Palms River, New Jersey, then. And basically, they took the Firebird Trans Am and gave it a little special sauce, perked it up a little bit. This one's a six-speed manual, which is the one you want. And what's cool about this is not only is it a relatively rare car, they only built 500 of them. This is number 102. This one has less than 2,500 miles on the odometer. And it just squeezed its way into the top five. Number four sale overall for the day at $25,500. We've seen that gentleman a few times today. And congratulations as he gets to roll away with this very cool Pontiac. Corvair time, how about a 1963 Corvair Monza Spider? Well, a very, very special and significant car in so many ways. Forget the Ralph Nader unsafe at any speed routine. This is America's first turbocharged, mass-produced passenger car. 1962 and 3, this and the old Cutlass. But at the back of this one, we will have a look at the turbocharged engine. Then we'll look underneath it. Now, we look here, we can see that chromium-looking thing. That's the turbo right there. And General Motors was very brave to turbocharge an air-cooled flat six like this. Let's take a peek with the chassis cam and see how this one looks underneath. There's the underside of the car. Again, no engine up front. That's the gas tank. That's the flat floor. And there's the transaxle at the back with those swing axles that made the Corvair a little bit tricky in the handling department. But again, a very significant car. America's first turbos. Yep, the uh, old Cutlass and the Spider Corvair turbo. You know, you talked about how brave they were to put a turbo on. They were just brave to come out with this car completely. I mean, you think about this. This was radical in every way for Detroit. You know, to come up with a rear engine vehicle that was air cooled. It was completely different. I love the branding and the marketing. The logo here at the back, only seen on turbo cars, this circle with the two arrows indicating the rotation of the turbo unit. Only seen on turbo cars. And no four doors, wagons, or pickups. Strictly, there were two door convertibles and coupes. $17,000 for that Corvair Monza from 1963, and we're going to check in with Tyler Hoover. Well, if you like the Buick Grand National, but you wanted to be a little bit more stealth, or maybe you're crazy and didn't like black, well, then you could get the Buick Regal T-Type, which is what this is. It's pretty rare, an oddball one, uh, but it has the look of a Buick Regal. You still have the T-Tops, but you could do different colors. This one's in gray, normal bucket seats, but then you go under the hood, and you still get that 3.8-liter turbocharged, that legend legendary motor which you can see right here this one uh, probably a lot more than the 245 horsepower stock that these had you can see all the mods on here the different fuel injection uh, looks like maybe a bigger turbo as well intercoolers i imagine this one is probably double the horsepower it's very easy to do with the bolt-ons on these this one will be a really cool sleeper yeah, I look forward to seeing that up on the block before too long. Meanwhile, this is a car that we previewed a little while ago, a 1967 Auto Bianca Bianchina wagon. Yeah, cute little creature. you got to remember that European driving conditions are very different from those here in the United States. So little cars like this made perfect sense on the narrow streets of many European towns and cities of the day. A car this completely reminds me of, which is a Volkswagen Squareback. You look at this body style, it's very, very similar. You were to put the two cars side by side, eh, this one's a little bit smaller, but the same basic concept in the way they built it. Of course, the Bianchi, Auto Bianchi name comes out of Bianchi, which was a bicycle manufacturer starting in the late 1800s, moving forward, and ultimately they combined several companies together to create Auto Bianchi. 
1967 Bianca Wagon, $10,000. Now for something much bigger, a 1970 Chevy Malibu. This is our first Chevelle. And you got to remember, of course, this one is not a super sport, and most Chevelles were just regular Malibus like this one here. This one has a 350 under the hood. It does have a ZL2 style cowl induction hood, not something you get without the super sport. These are commonly available today as reproductions. But again, a nice cruiser. I like the rally wheels. I had the good fortune of growing up in Los Angeles, and for us, going to Malibu Beach, you know, wasn't that unusual. We did it all the time. But if think about it, if you were in Kansas, if you were in Iowa, the name Malibu just evokes something special. To name a car Malibu? Well, yeah, Chevelle's nice, but the Malibu name was special. And this one's kind of cool. It's a four-speed transmission equipped car. Not sure if it was originally built that way, but no harm in adding it. Or if it's an original non-SS four-speed Malibu, that's a pretty unusual powertrain combination. Most of these were automatics. You know, and the question with this car is what do you do with it? Do you just leave it like this, or do you go ahead and make it into an SS clone? Personally, I'd love to leave it like this. Make it the way it was that most people were really buying these cars. I mean, no one, there were plenty of SSs sold, but when you look at the total number of sales, there were a lot more simple Malibus sold ever than the SSs. And this one does come with the original build sheet and window sticker, which are not available to me right now. If I saw those, I could tell if it was originally a factory four-speed or not. With that said, it's a nice cruiser, great paint on this one, a lot of eyeball appeal. Well, the consigner does make the point this has a 350 cubic inch crate engine inside, so there have already been some changes. And once again, whether it's originally a four-speed or not, at this point, doesn't really matter. Tell you what, $35,000, the current bid right now, it's tied as the number one sale today, and that is exactly where it's going to end up. $35,000 for a 1970 Malibu in beautiful cranberry red. Let's check in with Craig Jackson and Mike McCullough. We're going to preview something special that will be up on the block. First time an American car has sounded like that. This is one of the most anticipated cars. Mike, this is the Z06 3LZ version in a convertible with the 5.5 liter flat plane crank putting out 670 horsepower. The Z06, the 5.5 liter engine is backed by that eight speed dual clutch automatic transmission. This car is finished in Arctic white with a jet black interior. This car only has just over 400 miles. So if you didn't get an opportunity to buy one brand new, you got an opportunity right now to pick up one like new. It's an unbelievable car. Yeah, that's one of the great cars we're gonna see crossing the block on Super Saturday. Some very special machinery and I look forward to seeing that. Meanwhile, up on the block right now, good money for a 1995 Chevy Impala. Well, I remember when these came out, you know, rear-wheel drive, full-size V8 cars were a very uncommon thing. Chevrolet did us all a wonderful favor by reintroducing the four-door muscle car in the Impala SS. 260 horsepower, four-wheel disc brakes, the handling of a Camaro, a little bigger car, of course, but these are collectible then and now. I love that logo on the back on the side where it's blacked out so it kind of blends in. It, you don't notice it right off the bat, but it's tr true Impala SS. And what's special about this one, just over 5,000 miles on the odometer. It only made for a few years. The Impala SS dipped into the taxi and police parts bin. No problem there. The heavy duty suspension, the police brakes, but again, the branding of a fun, personal luxury car. The SS. Well, you can hear the bidder assistant correcting the auctioneer, making sure they've got the exact right number. In this case, is thirty-four thousand five hundred dollars. And somebody just bid thirty-four seven, bumped him up by a couple hundred bucks. Now the bidder assistant's going. Do you want to go more? Yep, thirty-five thousand. That's where the hammer comes down. Thirty-five thousand dollars to that gentleman right there. 
That means we now have a three-way tie as the number one sales of the day with a Trans Am, an Impala, and a Malibu all at 35 grand. How about a 1965 Cadillac DeVille convertible, the one that April Rose previewed for us? You know, GM Design led the world, and if you're a little kid growing up in Italy or Japan or Scotland, you wanted a big American car. Now, sometimes we get jaded and think, wow, what a gaudy thing, but you know, slow it down and look at this thing. What a beautiful design this is. Just soak it in. Now, this one has something unusual, the Sabre spoke cast aluminum wheels, which are from the 50s, but bolt right on and add a lot of Cadillac heritage to this vehicle. You're right, Steve. Those wheels give it a great look. 54,000 miles on the clock. And uh, this is said to be an original, unrestored car. Boy, uh, has it been treated well. Now, this. just don't see these cars this condition. Restore this car. You look at all of that chrome, all the trim. You can't buy that reproduction. That car is unrestored. Absolutely beautiful. We're hoping it would be north of 50,000. So pay attention. It's going to sail. 35. This car is very pure, right down to the single exhaust. Yeah, I mean, I always point this out. A lot of folks put dual exhaust on it to get the noise, but Cadillac had high-flow single exhaust systems on their luxury cars. In fact, all of the cars, because the reality is dual pipes transmit more noise into the car, and Cadillac had single exhaust from 61 onward. Well, right now, this is the number one sale of the day. We're at 39000 The question is, how much longer and how much higher will we go? Well, I am not surprised. Palm Beach is known as a Cadillac market, and there are some consigners that hold back their Cadillacs, even from Scottsdale, to bring them here because this audience really appreciates them. And I can't, I don't know when I've seen a better survivor from the 60s in a Cadillac than this. We've got an internet bidder, we've got a bidder, two bidders on the block, one on one side, one on the other. What a beast of a car in terms of length. I mean, the wheelbase, almost 130 inches. The overall length, 224. Yep, we've seen that guy before. And he now has the number one sale of the day at $41,000 for that 1965 Cadillac DeVille convertible. And coming up in just a little bit, how about a 1975 Corvette convertible, 350 cubic inches, V8 transmission, automatic transmission, repainted in flame orange. We'll see it soon. Consign now to join the world-class collector vehicles already in the lineup for Barrett Jackson's 2023 Las Vegas event. June 22nd through the 24th in the West Hall of the Convention Center. Sell your car where the bidders are. If you're going to spend spring break down here in Florida, the Palm Beach area, you got to come by. The Barrett Jackson Collector Car Auction, the South Florida Fairgrounds. Plenty of fun stuff crossing the block. All kinds of interesting thing on this first day. Remember, we have three full days. This 2003 Ford F-350 Lariat is up on the block right now. This is a Super Duty. Early on in the Super Duty's run, of course, Super Duty now and then meant heavy, heavy-duty Ford F-Series pickup truck. This one about as big as it gets with the dually rear axle, one-ton frame, and four-door cab. This one has the six-liter Power Stroke turbo diesel with a five-speed automatic. $31,000 the hammer price on that beast of a vehicle, F-350 Lariat. Once again, they'll write the price on the sold sticker, which is great when you're walking around Bear Jackson, enjoying the cars. You see some of them sold, and you know exactly what they sold for. 2003 Hummer H2. Yeah, you might call this the, the 7 tenths scale Hummer H1, but the irony is that these came with 6-liter gasoline V8 engines and nearly twice the horsepower of any military Hummer ever. Go figure. But again, a military Hummer doesn't have to cruise at 85 miles an hour on the I-40. This does. Yeah, they even made a half-scale H3 on the Chevy Trailblazer chassis. Uh, sunset orange, that is a factory color on these. They were not all... Uh, olive drab or desert tan, not these civilian versions. And these were done to a, a very high standard inside. 
the console very, very wide uh, because of all of the running gear there. But you get bucket seats front and rear. So uh, a good bit of comfort to go with all of the uh, off-road prowess here. Four-wheel disc brakes. One thing you won't see on these is the portal-style gear reduction axles on the H1. These have a, st a traditional Sterling-type rear axle. Differential hangs kind of down low in the middle, which you know could snag on a tree stump, but you're not going to take one of these off-road more often than not. People coming, people going in the bidding world. Looks like online. That's who got it. $22,000, the final bid, that Hummer H2. Let's check it with Tyler Hoover. I'm with lot 93.1, a 1993 Ford Mustang 5.0. And with the Blueprint engine cam, let's take a look at that 5.0 liter V8 engine under the hood. Of course, 230 horsepower. This is a pretty iconic motor of the 80s and 90s. The Fox body lovers just eat these things up. This one, very, very stock. You can see the factory intake there. And then one thing you don't see unless it's a very low mileage car is the cover the little condom for the ignition the cap and rotor is still there the reason it's still there well this one's about the nicest i've seen in a long time only 3,000 original miles on this fox body 5.0 convertible bright red paint just gorgeous new in the wrapper i love that color the beautiful white top and oh it's a great era for that car we'll see it up on the block before too long meanwhile something really interesting up on the block now a 2018 custom Faro trike. What makes this really unusual? It's electric. Okay, it's my turn to say I've never seen one. Uh, not sure how many were built. $90,000 to put this together. Uh, has a Subaru WRX throttle uh, connecting it to this electric drivetrain. Uh, the trunks are really saddlebags on either side. Look at the size of that single rear tire. Look at the chain driving it on the left-hand side. Massive sprocket and the faceted plastic design of the body. But again, the sprocket on this side, the monoleaf in the back. Look at that chain. You use your kind of, you would assume maybe a belt or something like that. But again, that'll never wear out. And what an interesting design this is. Now, as car-like as it is, it is a trike. So in most states, you would register this as a motorcycle, not as an automobile. Check your local regulations. But the cool thing is when you're coming up behind somebody, yeah, it's a little low, but it still looks like a car. You're not going to, they're going to see it easily. You know, and we're getting already into the world of electric motorcycles. I mean, Harley Davidson has live wire and all that. But this is a pretty cool build using a Tesla battery pack that is liquid cool. So very neat build. That explains the Tesla T logo's front and rear. Now it all makes sense. I'm not sure I understand it, but I like it. This is, uh, I mean, you talk about unique. You won't see another one. Yeah, that's what makes it cool. I know we have an internet bidder. We had a phone bidder. There we've got somebody up in the skybox that's bidding on it. It's got a backup camera, touchscreen radio. It's got Bluetooth. It's got some big Rockford Fosgate speakers. I mean, this really is a pretty comfortable machine when you look at it. Well, there you go to the skybox, $26,000 for a very unique 2018 custom Faro bike. And the Summit Racing Soul Sticker goes on, and away it goes for $26,000. Up on the block now, a 1986 Buick Regal. This is a custom T-type coupe, one of 1,921 examples. Well, that's right. Don't call it a Grand National. The Grand National had a, uh, a more pedestrian-looking cousin in the form of the uh, T-type. Uh, this one has been perked up quite a bit with a roller cam, a larger turbo, four-wheel Willwood disc brakes. Some would question the wisdom of modifying one of these. I mean, we'll say back in the 80s or 90s, it was classic to add all kinds of goodies to make them even quicker. But again, these are worth quite a bit quite a bit of money now stock but again well done tasteful modifications on this one well you're right steve less than two thousand of these were built and this one highly modified four-wheel willwood disc brakes on it 
Uh, we can only assume that the engine in this may have come under some kind of upset and needed to be rebuilt. So if you're going to be rebuild it, well, let's go large. And uh, that's what they did with all those aftermarket goodies to improve the performance. The bidders, of course, will decide its true worth. And you think about it, we used to think it was a heresy to do a custom job on a 63 split window Corvette. Now we see a lot of those. Same thing may hold for these, you know. Obviously, if you've got a real one, it's still stock. It increased the value because now this one isn't. And if you want a resto mod, well, that's what they've created right here. This one has the uh, seldom seen T-tops. I'd say maybe 30% of the cars came with the removable glass panels here. Kind of a mixed bag. I mean, if you live in an arid place, that's fine. But they do tend to leak a little bit of water when they get older. But again, it's a plus, not a minus, to have the T-tops. $27,000 for a 1986 Buick Regal T-type coupe, rare and modified. Beautiful day here in Florida and out in the McGuire staging lanes. All kinds of great cars left across the block. Remember, we still have hours to go in our coverage here of the Barrett Jackson Collector Car Auction from Palm Beach. And I love the type of cars we've got going today. A wide variety. We got MGs, we got trucks, and we've got Corvettes like this one we previewed a little while ago from 1975. 75 was a dark year in many ways. No more 454 big blocks. This one has the J-Code base engine with 165 net horsepower. But again, it's a roadster. It's an automatic. It's orange. And it's a pretty desirable car. They're coming on strong, even though they're not that fast. And it's fairly rare. Only about 4,600 convertibles were built in 1975, though it was one of the biggest sales year totals uh, for Corvettes to date. This one with just uh, with about 80,000 miles on it has been well enjoyed. Yeah, something new on the passenger side is a bump in the floor where the catalytic converter goes. So these have a catalytic converter under the floor right about there. There is a heat shield. It doesn't cook your feet. But again, the catalytic converter was all about cleaning the air. It was restrictive to the engine's exhaust breathing. But again, we need clean air. I get that too. $18,500 for that 1975 Corvette. Not the high water mark for horsepower, but still a nice looking car. And yes, it is a Corvette. 1986 Chevy K5 Blazer. Yeah, the K5 Blazer, of course. It's not a K10. It's not considered a half ton vehicle. It's a light half, but again, uh, the K means four-wheel drive, and in Blazer land, we're looking at a beam axle up front with leaf springs. At Ford, their Bronco would have coil springs and a split axle. So they did similar things, but very differently, the Blazer and the Bronco. You know, for a second, let's go back to the catalytic converter issue because they are much maligned, but they did quite a bit to clean the air. GM's prior effort at uh, was the AIR, the uh, Air Injection Reaction System. And it was kind of the Wizard of Oz because the air leaving the engine was still pretty dirty. The smog pump would add fresh air in the exhaust manifold, so by the time that exhaust got out the pipe, it wasn't as dirty. It was a Band-Aid fixed. Thank goodness the catalytic converters came along to replace them. Yeah, the big enemy of the catalytic converter was leaded fuel, and that's why they had those restrictors in the fuel filters. No leaded gas, because it would poison a catalytic converter. But again, a converter was a, a baby step toward the modern engines we have now that are very clean and give us the power we love. This one here has, this blazer has been lifted quite a bit, probably about a five inch lift kit. And again, with these, it's easy to do because of the leaf springs, put a blazer or put a block in there and you're good to go. Well, solid money, $30,000 easily into our top 10 for that 86 K5 blazer. And don't forget to tune into our Super Saturday coverage at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. It'll be on the History Channel all day. And whether you're a true history buff or you just tune in for episodes of your favorite series, the History Tour is your one-stop shop for exclusive and official History Channel gear. So shop now and get your piece of history at thehistorystore.com. 1981 Corvette. 
Well, the next to last year for the third generation Corvette seen right here. Something kind of unique and interesting is the fact that the hatch window in the back here does not lift. It's strictly uh, nailed down always. But in 1982, the collector edition did have hinges finally. So even though this thing came along in 70, 78, uh, it never did function. It'd be nice if it did to get things in there. But again, only the collector's editions had a hinge at the back. Copy of the original window sticker is uh, included with this one. And this has been a nicely kept car. 18,000 actual miles. Uh, those optional polished alloy wheels bolt on. And, uh, of course, uh, the T-tops in kind of a mirror reflecting glass. Yeah, this was the small gauge. Notice how the exhaust tips are very much unadorned, kind of meant to hide in plain sight. They're just regular tubing right here, whereas now Corvette dual exhaust are accentuated, and back in the 60s and early 70s, they were also, but in the 80s, well, emissions were the thing, and you didn't want to brag about dual exhaust. You didn't want to get Uncle Sam's attention on your high-performance car. And this was the era when horsepower was just starting to come back. I think we're at 190 horsepower in this. The next year was going to bump up to about 200 or so, and slowly it was going to begin to climb. But a lot better than it was back in the 165 horsepower days. $20,000, that's what that'll sell for, a 1981 Corvette. We're going to check in with April Rose. Uh, I found something really sweet. 1957 BMW Isetta, 0 to 60 in, well, never. Top speed, 53 if you're lucky. And I love this sort of refrigerator door handle. It pops up. It's pretty roomy in there. Very, very cool. It's got a 298cc air-cooled, one-cylinder engine, four-speed manual, not a ton of storage inside, sort of a top pocket shelf in the back there and some side pockets in the door. And I love this cloth top sunroof. I mean, if you're tall, you just pop your head out of there and you can see everything. Nice, bright, two-tone finish and coral red and sand beige. And I'll tell you a not-so-secret secret, our very own Rick DeBrule, he's got a serious crush on these, don't you, Rick? Uh, not a crush, but I do own one. It's in my garage. I love that thing. And by the way, that's not a sunroof. Technically, that is an escape hatch because it's only got one door. If you rear in somebody, you got to be able to get out of it. 1977 Mercedes-Benz 450 SL that's part of the Boyd collection. 4.5 liter V8, only 57,000 actual miles on this two top uh, Mercedes and only two owners, complete owner history here. Um, Here's Steve Davis. Beautifully, absolutely unbelievable condition. Garage kept its entire life, and these opportunities do not come around often. Do not miss this beautiful 450SL. One, one challenge unique to Mercedes of this period was the hubcaps. They were painted to match the body, and there were about 14 different colors possible. So the trouble is, in New England, I recall, if you were stuck in snow, spinning tires, you'd wear the paint off of the hubcap. But I can only imagine the inventory control problems at Mercedes matching the right hubcap to the right car. But that's a Mercedes thing right there. This is just so clean. Two owners, always garaged, 57,000 miles. You think about it, you know, they've come from the 190s and the 60s. They had the 232, 52, 80. Then the 350 came along and the 450 in the 1970s. If you had money, this was the car you had to have to be seen driving around in. Love this uh, pale gray, almost chalk with the uh, navy blue interior. $44,000. Brand new number one seller of the day. $44,000 for this 77 Mercedes 450 SL. Here we have just an amazing original condition. 72 Cadillac Eldorado. It's got a big 500 cubic inch, 235 horsepower V8 with only 40,130 miles. This thing is absolutely beautiful. It features a narrow white walls, fender skirts, gleaming chrome. And keep in mind, it's an original car. These cars do not come across the block often. It's been in a beautiful collection. Do not miss your opportunity selling right now. No reserve. All right. Yeah, this is a 1972 Cadillac Eldorado, another one from the Boyd collection. 
Well, the long hood on this is there for two reasons. One, to accommodate the front-wheel drive unit, which was part of the Eldorado from 67 onward, but also early on in the development of these, in the early 60s, Cadillac actually planned a V12 engine that was going to be used. That's why they had designed it to accept that. I, was, I had the pleasure of going to the Cadillac Heritage Museum one time when Mr. Wallace, who runs it, showed us the Cadillac V Future V12. I wouldn't believe it, but there it was, an engineering prototype. So the 12-cylinder never, never made it, but the long hood is ready for it, but it adds a really exclusive look to the Cadillac Eldorado. Now, you saw that it show, said Eldorado in a couple of places, but it does not say Cadillac, though it uses the Cadillac crest. Note particularly uh, this chrome vent-looking apparatus behind the door. That is a nod to the Cadillacs of, say, 1953 uh, that had that in an update of the 4849 Cadillac styling. Another detail worth noting, the originality of this car right down to the original single exhaust. I keep harping on that, but Lincoln and Imperial at this point in time had dual exhaust options or standard. Cadillac did not offer dual exhaust despite the 500 cubic inch engine under the hood. The point of that was the big single exhaust system on this thing did the job just fine, but didn't drum or resonate for a quieter car. It's a Cadillac, not a GTO. Love that beautiful uh, teal-looking, bright green metallic color. That is original to the car, uh, as is the green interior. $19,000 for a 1972 Cadillac Eldorado that is just a beast of a car with only two doors. Well, coming up, a 1970 Camaro Custom will be up on the block. Big 454 cubic inch engine, four-speed transmission. It's got power disc brakes, traction bars, all kinds of competition gear on this thing. We'll see it soon. The all-new line of Barrett Jackson merchandise and apparel is now available. From road rallies to the office, there are many stylish options for the car lover. Available year-round or online at shopbarrettjackson.com. Welcome back to the Barrett Jackson Collector Car Auction in Palm Beach. I'm here in the staging lanes drooling over the cars, and this one in particular has really caught my eye. It's a 1998 BMW Z3 M, lot 88.1. Of course, the Z3 came out a few years earlier, but they gave it the M treatment with the wider body, the more beautiful wheels. This one in a Mola red. April previewed a BMW Isetta earlier that couldn't get to 60. This one did it pretty darn fast in five seconds with that manual transmission, but under the hood is where they have that M performance power right here 3.2 liter inline six 240 horsepower this one as clean as can be only 57,000 original miles I love this car back to the block yeah really to be honest with nothing to love not to love about that in terms of the styling and the performance up on the block now a 1976 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am highly optioned car EM FM 8 track player inside and note especially the wheels. On this Trans Am, they would have been 15-inch uh, snowflake-style aluminum wheels, but here we see them as 17-inchers, uh, brand new with Nito tires. So that's a very nice upgrade. As performance tires in smaller sizes are getting tougher to find, uh, I think that's a very appropriate upgrade. 71,000 miles. $23,000, that's the price for that 1976 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am. We'll tune into the History Channel to see some of the most exciting automotive innovations of the future today. Five entrepreneurs will battle it out for $100,000 in cash and prizes. It's SEMA Launchpad, and it premieres on, premieres on Saturday, April 15th at 9 a.m. Eastern Time on the History Channel. Up on the block now, a 1956 Thunderbird. Well, this one's had a lot of work done to it. In fact, the entire fuel system from fuel tank to carburetor uh, have been replaced or rebuilt atop that 312 V8. Kelsey Hayes wheels, Goodyear wide whites, and a highly optioned car with power windows, power seat, and both hard and soft top. The consigner of this car has owned it for the past 41 years. It was a daily driver for two seasons, and then it uh, became the Sunday Funday car. Yeah, what a great story to think that they originally bought this in 1982. And granted, it was a used vehicle back then, but they've had it for all this time. Looks great up on the block. And look at this number, only at $18,000. I mean, yeah, it's not an absolute fresh restoration like some of the ones we see that come out of the Minter garage. 
but overall a great driver car. It's got great appeal, and it's a 56. You know, it's got that great Continental kit on the back. It has a particular appeal. I remember talking with Amos Minter, who restores these, and he said, when it comes to Thunderbirds, women in particular love the 1956 model. Something about that rear Continental kit that they love. And uh, this is that Thunderbird tealish blue, kind of a signature color. In fact, all of the emblems of the cars are this color. Hang on air conditioning unit under the dash, as was widely done throughout the 50s and 1960s. That dashboard shared a lot of its design with the full-size Fords of the day. Same for the headlights and the taillights. Family resemblance is what they were trading on. Subtle changes between the 55 and the 56. More changes between the 56 and the 57. Of course, the big change was they got rid of that Continental kit on the back because while it looked great, a lot of unsprung weight made it kind of tail happy. $27,000. Man, hard to miss that guy in that shirt. He's been buying cars all day long. $27,000 for the price on that one. Once again, we're going to keep looking at all the cars as they cross the block here today because it is quite a variety at the Barrett Jackson Collector Car Auction in Palm Beach. We got a new number one seller here on the first day of the Barrett Jackson Collector Car Auction. Not what you were expecting. How about a 1948 MGTC Roadster? Beautifully done with a Judson Supercharger, $50,000, the hammer price. And away it goes to a brand new owner. And Rick, I think those add-ons were what put it over the top. The period Judson Supercharger, the wacky Arnold uh, intake manifold and tap it cover. Boy, a lot went into that build. And just a few moments ago, we saw a 1953 MGTD roll across and sell for $35,000. So a TD and a TC both bringing good money in. Up on the block now, this is a car that Tyler Hoover previewed, a 1998 BMW Z3 M Roadster. Well, they took the little Z3, which started with a four-cylinder, and when they put the six-cylinder M motor into it uh, with its five-speed and uh, different width tires front and rear and those uh, supportive sport seats, and you had yourself a budget supercar. These things were fantastic. They were over $50,000 new, and the quad pipes denotes it as the M Roadster. These are a lot of fun. I always thought these were the cars that the Mazda Miata owners graduated to. Took it up to that next level. More performance, a little bigger. $25,000 for that beautiful 1998 BMW Z3 M Roadster. Now, some cars are obvious collectibles, but some cars, well, not so much. But they're coming into their own, so we're going to call them second chance collectibles. Here's Mike Joy. This is the row of ugly ducklings, cars you did not want to be seen arriving or leaving high school in, but decades later they have become quite collectible. Case in point, the AMC Pacer. Marketed as the first wide, small car. It was the perfect answer to a question nobody had asked. But today, people want these. How about the Chevy Citation? One of the first mass-produced front-wheel drive American cars, this X11 with sporting pretensions. Not so much. But where have you seen one in this condition? How about a 1969 Fiat 500? Need I say more? Or a DeSoto? Any DeSoto. Fins were in in the late 1950s, but by the mid-60s, these were seen as garish. And today, very collectible. But the ultimate ugly duckling has to be the Ford Pinto. Sedan runabout wagon, the up-level Pinto Squire version, very late build, 1980. These were very inexpensive, disposable cars. People bought them and drove these late into the 80s because that's what they could afford. Today, this car with its unbelievable Vaquero plaid upholstery is drawing a ton of attention at Barrett Jackson. Yes, ugly ducklings can grow up to be beautiful swans.
And you know, they're all cars we can relate to. Those are the cars we rode around in, and that Pinto sold for $14,000, a fun collectible. Yeah, and the underbidder told me he wanted to buy it at that price, put a small block Chevy in it. Why not? And you got to remember, too, that Pacer and Citation were submodels of another American loser mobile, the Edsel. Once again, it all boils down to what do you like? Maybe it's a car you drove around in. Maybe it's a car your neighbor had. I'm a big fan of the Falcons. I love those. And our producer, Neil Sullivan, just bought a 64. So we like some of those cars that other folks have forgotten. 1970 Chevy Camaro. Yeah, kind of a cool Friday night cruiser. This car was born with a 123 VIN. Yeah, it was a six owner car of maybe 20%. Most were V8s, but that was then. It's now got a Z28 makeover with a 10 volt rear axle traction bars. And I kind of like this, sort of a pro stock 1971 style paint job. Big block Chevy under the hood now. Yeah, 454 cubic inches. Uh, that spoiler on the back was standard on the Z28 for 1970. Uh, this is not, however, a Z28. That's okay. $24,500 for a custom 1970 Chevrolet Camaro. Away we go, but we promised we're coming back. I mean, how could we not when we have all these great cars left across the block during our coverage of Barrett Jackson? Sun, fun, and cars. Who could ask for anything more here in Palm Beach, Barrett Jackson? 1993 Ford Mustang GT convertible, the one that Tyler Hoover previewed just a little while ago. Uh, 3,460 miles, but uh, 1993 was also the final year for the Fox Mustang, and 1994 brought on the SN95. However, 93 was the final year the convertibles were done off-house at Cars and Concepts. Every one of these Fox convertibles went about a 50-mile round trip to Cars and Concepts to be decapitated and turned into a convertible. This one is a 5.0. It is an automatic, but again, under 4,000 miles. Pretty cool. You know, we talk about the modern collectibles, cars from the late 80s to the early 2000s. This is definitely in that sweet spot. And really it was the return of fun cars in terms of what the, the Ford Morse Mustang world was going to. The GT had a little more power and great look. And like you talk about, that convertible that was so nicely done. Now, the LX could also be had with the Hot 5.0, but the GT was the one with the body kit and the controversial cheese grater taillights, which were seen only on GTs. Some people liked them. Some people loved them. Well, $37,000 for that car that has less than 4,000 miles on the odometer. Let's check in with April Rose. Rick, I want you to meet my new best friend. This is Buttercup, 1971 Chevy C10 Cheyenne, C meaning two-wheel drive. You got the chrome bumper up front, chrome trim along the side. Now, the distinctive feature is that wood that runs all the way down the side. It's got the long bed, eight feet long, and she's got a rebuilt 402 big block automatic, which this second generation was the first to offer automatic. Now take a peek inside. Very sweet Cheyenne door panels, the bench seat, original radio, and I'm going to guess this bottle opener right here. It wasn't stock, but hey, you know, that's nice to have. The headliner looks great. Nice detailing and all the Cheyenne trim. And these square body trucks, they're always an eye turner, but especially with this two tone paint buttercup looks so fun to drive rick give me the keys i tell you what there was a song build me up buttercup that's it right there love to drive that off el camino time up on the block in 1970. yeah this one is an ss 396 not sure it's a documented original but it presents the part of course the 396 is the big block plenty of horsepower el camino the best combination of a passenger car and a pickup truck there ever was not too big not too small and the consigner lists this car as a 1970 Chevrolet El Camino pickup. They're not calling it an SS in the title, and they're saying that it has SS390 equip equipment. So the bottom line here is, while it looks like an SS, if you go off of what they're actually saying, it is not. But it looks great. It's got a great appeal. So why not? 
And to your point, Rick, until 1972, Chevrolet VINs only tell you if it's an eight-cylinder car or a six-cylinder car. We go to the VIN, we see 136. Yeah, it was born in V8, but it could have been a 307, a 350, a 396, or a 454. You choose. Well, this does have the round gauges that you would have with the SS, and that's a, a pretty time-consuming and expensive thing to swap out. $24,000, and we're going to check in with Tyler Hoover. I'm with Lot 113, a 2012 Chevrolet Camaro ZL1. And with the Blueprint Engine Cam, let's take a look under the hood. Of course, the ZL1 is a legendary name with Camaro from the late 60s when they put the big blocks in. So when they brought it back this year in 2012, they needed to do something special, and you can see it a supercharged LS engine. This one horsepower is behind only the ZR1 Corvette. This one 580 horsepower, zero to 60 around four seconds. These things were great performing track cars for the street. And this one, of course, being the first year of the ZL1 coming back is pretty special. Six speed manual transmission to throw back to that old school to Camaro vibe. Absolutely love these things. Well, thanks a lot, Tyler. We'll see that before too long. Meanwhile, on for a cool car from the Boyd Collection. In this case, it's a 1949 Studebaker Land Cruiser sedan. I had not heard of the Land Cruiser when I researched this car uh, to, for the Boyds to bring it to auction. But at 2550, it was the most expensive Studebaker of 1949. 226 cubic inch flathead six cylinder, three speed manual, pristine engine bay. The interior looks brand new and only 25,000 miles. Yeah, the Land Cruiser, not a Toyota. The Land Cruiser was the long wheelbase version of the Studebaker family. And something we see on the back of this is Studebaker's, is it coming or going, said Bob Hope, the comedian, because the rear window kind of looks like the front window. You call it. Uh, I, I'm intrigued by this interior finish on the seats because I believe this interior could go with any exterior color, and maybe it did. Coming from one of the best collections in the world, three-speed manual transmission, 226 cubic inch flathead LS6 engine made it to this transmission. Absolutely drives beautiful, pristine in every way with only 24,395 miles. Here's an opportunity that very rarely knocks at your door. We're kicking the door down. Don't miss it. It's going to sell. 18. Now, the bumper guards on this front and rear are period accessories. The Helms Company out of Grand Rapids, Michigan made these. And they have protected the bumpers all these years. Oh, there's a deal. $18,000 for a 1949 Studebaker Land Cruiser sedan. And as Mike was saying, when was the last time you saw one of those things? Barrett-Jackson.com. That's the place to go to to see the full list of cars that will be crossing the block over the course of the next few days. You can also check out prices of cars that have already sold. What did it sell for in Scottsdale? Well, you can do your research and learn more about the current trends within the collector car world. 2002 Camaro SS Convertible up on the block. Well, this is the final iteration for the fourth generation Camaro. It's hard to imagine that Chevrolet walked away from the Camaro for eight years before 2010 when they brought it back, but they did. They handed the pony car market over to Ford. But with that said, here's the 2002 final year, and these were done by SLP once again. Street Legal Performance did the SS conversion as they did the Firehawk transformation on the Firebird. A legitimate six-speed, 35th anniversary SS convertible. Very, very low-mile car, only 10,000 miles on it. Factory fresh condition, and we're just, we're not even crawling up to its original sticker price. I remember I was at Hot Rod Magazine in 2002 as tech editor. At that point in time, Camaro sales were in the dumpster. I hate to say it, these were expensive and not very highly desired. When Chevrolet dropped the Camaro in 2002, everybody says, what are you doing? Well, look at the sales numbers. It was completely understandable. They weren't selling. But look at this. Where are you going to get a practically brand new convertible for $28,000 with that kind of horsepower and a six-speed transmission? Nowhere but Thursday at Barrett Jackson. And to be honest with you, the fact that they took it away kind of adds to the story. It makes this a little more collectible and desirable in my book. $29,000 for a 2002 Camaro SS convertible. 
Well, coming up in just a little bit, we'll say that same year from 2002. How about a Pontiac Trans Am Collector's Edition Convertible? It's got the 346 cubic inch LS1 V8 engine, 320 horsepower. back to the Barrett Jackson Collector Car Auction from Palm Beach. We're here at the South Florida Fairgrounds. Place is packed. More than 600 cars. Every single one of them will be selling at no reserve over the course of the next three days. Remember, this is just day one of the auction. We'll be here both Friday and Saturday. Up on the block now, a 1967 Cadillac DeVille. Well, how can something so big be so sporty at the same time? Well, it's a four-door hardtop. Again, no fixed pillars on the door frames or in the middle of the roof. You can also get that if you wanted. But again, 67 was the final year for the 429 under the hood. The 472 would arrive in 68. But again, beautiful styling on this. This has really grown on me over the years. I no longer find these to be large land yachts. They're actually beautiful. To slow it down, great-looking car. And uh, quite a story to this car. MLB All-Star Jeremy Jeffress, who was playing for the Milwaukee Brewers, bought this from a custom car shop in Milwaukee uh, during his tenure there. And there's some signed memorabilia from him that accompanies the car. These are body on frame, unlike certain Chrysler's at this point in time, which were unit construction, and even Lincoln's at this point were unit construction. So body on frame gives her a better chance at isolating the inside of the car from chassis and road noise than unit construction would. And while the Eldorados have a lot of appeal as two-door cars, the great thing about this is this is where you can take a, your, you know, your, your fun family with Go out for ice cream. Everybody's got a door to get in. There's plenty of room, plenty of leg room in the back. It's a great car. And I got to say, I always look underneath. It still has the original single exhaust. I always look. This one has not been meshed with, which is good news. Most people put duels on them, but that defeats the purpose. When you get that dual exhaust system, they rumble. It's all good. But again, it's not a Hemi Cuda. It's a Cadillac. You want it to be quiet. That single exhaust does the job. Well, by the pound, this is a heck of a deal, and this car is in beautiful shape. I think... I think there's a possibility you could daily drive this and enjoy it for uh, some years to come. And it's not a perfect car. I mean, I'm looking at the paint. It's you know, not perfect. The chrome is the same way. But in terms of the fact that it's all straight, it's all clean, it's pretty nice. And guess what? It just sold at $12,000. I think you're right. Per pound, that is just an absolute screaming deal. Congratulations to those folks right there. Rolling up behind it, another car from the Boyd Collection, a 1952 Studebaker Champion Convertible. Well, again, where'd you ever see one? This was the top-of-the-line Studebaker for 1952, and uh, you'll notice the camera comes up how this car is much narrower than its full-size competition from Ford, Chevrolet, and Plymouth. Uh, Studebaker played to that. They had a variety of body styles, including this, the top-of-the-line convertible. Yeah, this one is not the bullet nose. That would have been 1950 or 51 with that crazy circle in the front. But again, the champion would have been uh, the sporty version. This one does not have the optional V8. Studebaker had its own V8 1950. Yeah, the 239 cubic inch. But this one has this flathead six. Yeah, on it, kind of on its last legs, but it's bolted up to an automatic transmission. Now, here's another interesting interior choice. Oh, the door is locked. Well, we can't. Can we remedy that? Look at the uh, stripes here on the seats. You could put this interior with any exterior color. <laughs> great convertible top is in great shape. So is most of the stainless trim. Wide white walls, but where are the Studebaker fans? And there's the automatic logo on the back. If you had an automatic in the early 50s, you bragged about it, because in the 1940s, automatics were very, very uncommon. But in the 50s, it became more readily available as Borg Warner and Hydromatic began to sell their automatics to smaller companies like Studebaker that didn't make their own automatics. Well, $18,000, 1952 Studebaker Champion, sold brand new back in 52 for $2,090, only has 28,000 miles on the odometer. The way it goes and rolling up behind it, 
Oh, I love this. It's a 2009 Dodge Challenger Drag Pack. Well, you know, in the world of trucking, there's a thing called a glider kit. You can take your engine and your transmission and axles and add them to a brand new cab and frame. Well, the drag pack, when it debuted in 2009, was truly that. These have an engine and a transmission. When we come around to the back of this, we'll see the, these were delivered to the dealership on a beam axle. You had to supply your nine inch, your eight and three quarters. So these were truly kits you had to finish out and then go NHRA drag racing. From year to year, the drag pack would evolve into fully running cars with the Viper V10s, etc. But it all starts right here. This is a very important piece of Mopar drag racing history. Any collection should have this or one of these. And what's really cool is that they've left those original wheels on there. They haven't gone ahead and put on the big tires that they would have gone racing with. So this is exactly the way it was delivered to the dealer. Uh, this does not run. Once again, it's up to you to make it complete. But again, it's the raw material. But again, the drag pack program starts right here. Built in Brompton, Ontario, and then towed to the selling dealer, All-American Dodge in Midland, Texas. Well, the way that one goes, $28,000 for a 2009 Dodge Challenger drag pack. 2011 Camaro SS convertible coming up under the block. Well, 2011, first year for the return of the Camaro convertible. 2010, of course, saw the coupe, and this one is an SS, which means it's got the 6.2 liter V8 engine. Well, that'll do it for our first hour of live coverage here on FYI, but we're just getting rolling today. We still have another four action-packed hours to go. Stick around. Welcome to the world's greatest collector car auctions. This is Barrett Jackson, Palm Beach. And boy, what a day it's been so far. I love the car that's up on the block right now, a 2011 Camaro SS convertible from the Steve Todd Hunter collection. Yeah, this is a fifth generation Camaro. 2010 saw the coupe debut, and of course, 11 saw the open roof convertible, as we see it right here. This one has a 6.2 liter backed by an automatic, so it has 400 horsepower. Stick shift would have 426 horsepower. And this uh, 2011 Camaro has traveled just 11,000 actual miles, barely broken in. The fifth generation Camaro was truly a breakthrough. First Camaro with independent rear suspension, uh, possible V6 engine. The smallest engine had 300 horsepower. So, I mean, even the mildest Camaro at this point in time was as potent as anything from the 1980s. Well, it just sold here at Barrett-Jackson for $36,500. Makes its way into our top 10. You want to be a top 10 car right now for this first day of the Barrett-Jackson collector car auction? Better sell for at least $35,000. The number one sale overall so far is a 1948 MGTC Roadster, $50,000. Right behind it, 2002 Pontiac Trans Am Collector's Edition Convertible, another one from the Steve Todd Hunter Collection. Well, while the Camaro took a little hibernation between uh, 2002 and 2010, the Firebird never came back. The final year, right here, 2002, and the front fenders even have logos on them. It says Final Edition, Final Breed, and here it is right here. It's a convertible. This is the one you want. And that's the number, 1,000 miles. LS1 V8, Ram Air Induction, and that uh, 346 V8 is all aluminum. Yeah, the mighty LS1, you know, seen in Camaros, Corvettes, and even with an iron block in truck applications, the LS truly brought new life to the small block Chevy dynasty. The big question to me is always the hood on this. That's such an acquired taste. I mean, it's almost cartoonish in the way that they put it together with those big scoops on the front end. You know, yeah, we've got the screaming chicken on the back, but when you work your way around to the hood, not only do you have a screaming chicken, you've got two screaming chickens, one on each of the vents coming into the engine compartment. Yeah, that's the optional Ram Air hood. There was a more sedate, flat-ish hood available on Trans Ams at this point in time, but that feeds into a front air box and, and provides a little extra power with the cooler, denser air. It's not the prettiest thing, but it does work. I agree with you, Rick. I've never seen... I've never seen anything with four nostrils before other than this. 
There's a few alien movies I think I've seen with that kind of thing. And once again, it's an acquired taste. I have some friends who love the look of this because once again, it was that final maximum generation. How much horsepower can you get into this thing? But at the same time, it's different. We just saw that fifth generation Camaro with independent rear suspension. Well, these breathed their last gas with a, a, a live axle in the back. So Firebird never did evolve and get the independent rear suspension. It might have been destined for had it lived on. I'll tell you what, it's getting love in the room. $48,000, the current bid, meaning it's the number two sale of the day. Can it squeeze off a couple more and knock that, knock that MG off the top of the pile? We're about to find out. Well, it has a lot going for it. Final year of the build, you know, top spec of horsepower and the odometer, 1,000 miles. That all adds up well, right now to 48,000. Now came close, but it's the number two seller of the day so far at $48,000 for the 2002 Pontiac Trans Am Collector's Edition Convertible. 2000 Prowler from Plymouth is up on the block right now. Yeah, the Prowler, it's its hard to imagine. This is 23 years old, a quarter of a century? What? I remember when these came out, but I liked them. I didn't love them. My problem with these was they have a V6 engine here, not a V8. Although beyond that, the styling of a 32-4 Roadster, fully streetable. The bumpers are legal. The fenders, all of this stuff uh, makes it completely legal for road use, but yet it looks like an old hot rod. Truly, I mean, it took, it took balls for Chrysler to make this car. It really did. And I love them. Uh, there were kits to remove the front bumpers and uh, accommodate the turn signals and parking lights in a way that made this thing really look great. No, the V6 didn't have all the power in the world. It had rocker arm style formula car suspension in the front. It was an incredible build. These were fun cars, Steve, but after about 75 miles of driving them, you wanted to, maybe you wanted something else. One thing these things debuted in a mass production setting is a composite rear brake rotor. It's aluminum and steel bonded and molded together. It's not a big deal, but it is a big deal. They're lighter than iron, and yet the first time seen in mass production. We think about carbon ceramic brakes today, pretty exotic stuff. Well, that was exotic in the year 2000. Only 1,700 miles on this Prowler. These uh, began production as Plymouths, and when Chrysler Corp shuttered that venerable brand, the last couple of years of these were built as Chrysler Prowlers. To your point, Mike, I think if they just put a little more horsepower in that engine, a little bigger engine, I think these would have sold better and had a better market. They built a prototype with a V8, Rick. In fact, they even built a Prowler a howler pickup uh, for the SEMA show, but neither ever saw production. Shame. I guess they came out with this today, you know, with a, a, a you know, Turbo 4, Turbo 6. They probably could have pulled it off. $37,000. Well, that is the last of the Steve Todd Hunter collectibles we're going to see today, but we've still got more to come over the next couple days. In fact, Craig Jackson and Mike McCullough are going to take a look at some of the collection and the cool trucks and SUVs we're going to see. We're here in the truck and SUV section of the Steve Todd Hunter collection. Well, this H1 done in beautiful color. It's all original, it was bought new in Scottsdale, Arizona, 27,000 miles. Craig, this is a 2003, this is an open top truck version. They made them in a truck and a wagon. Um, and you know, you see a lot of these that people have taken, they ex-military vehicles, and they kind of repaint them, make them look like new. That, that's not the case with this one. This one was sold brand new to the public. It was the first time that they actually did that with these vehicles and then an 07 H2 here. Yeah, 07 H2, these are powered by the six liter V8s. Yeah. Super powerful, great riding. I had one of these brand new back in 05. I loved it, I still miss it to this day. Uh, this has 58,000 miles, and Steve bought this one brand new. Next up, we have a first edition Bronco. I have one of these fantastic cars. And when you got the first edition, they came with all the options very rare car done in the four-door version. Next, we have the Beast. The TRX has the Hellcat engine in it, 707 horsepower. Craig, this is the Ignition Edition, uh, finished in Go Mango. 
uh, these trucks are absolutely, like you said, they are B, 6.2 liter, 707 horsepower. It has the full off-road suspension. This truck is definitely at the pinnacle of performance uh, trucks on the planet today. Um, next to it, it's got, it's kind of what you call its predecessor. It's yep. the 2004 Dodge Ram uh, SRT10. With the Viper engine in it. That's right, it had the Viper V10, it had a six-speed manual transmission. Steve actually bought this truck brand new in 2004. In beautiful condition. I remember when they came out with these. Following along with, uh, with Steve's love of the Mopar uh, vehicles, uh, 1979 Little Red pickup truck. It's original paint, original interior. It has 70,000 original miles. Uh, and talking with Steve about this, he said, I don't know, you just get in it and it drives amazingly well for a 1979 pickup. And you just look at all of them, how clean the condition they're kept in. in a magnificent collection. And once again, once again, those are some of the great vehicles we'll see from the Steve Todd Hunter Collection crossing the block over the next couple of days. And we're going to take a quick break here at the Barrett Jackson Collector Car Auction in Palm Beach. Out of the McGuire staging lane, that is your last chance to look at the cars before they roll up onto the auction block. Relatively calm out there before the chaos of what happens center stage. And boy, there's a great collection. I love the El Camino, the Nova right there, the Olds, everything out there before it gets up onto the block. And guess what? We have a new top seller, a 1961 Pontiac Catalina. This is a tri-power convertible. It's got everything from the early 60s currently bid to $52,000. That beautiful restoration, of course, that stance on this is wider by about three inches than a Chevy or an Oldsmobile. This is the Pontiac wide track marketing and engineering on display. Well, they backed the bid up just a touch. Turned out it was only $50,000. That's what it sold for, meaning that is now tied with that MGTC Roadster. I love that J stone green color. Now tied once again at number one. Time for a pickup truck, a 1977 Chevy C10 Custom. Well, back in the mid-70s, there was a special edition of these called the Gentleman Jim, which was done up in gold and black. And this has been done in a tribute to that. Again, this is the square body. These are coming on strong with uh, collectors and drivers and everybody in between. And this one has an LS engine upgrade, but otherwise looks quite stock on the outside. A little bit lower than stock, but I like this. Very cool look. Yeah, this one has a lot of custom touches as well. You know, it's got a special tilt steering wheel that's been added, upgraded gauges. I love the fact they put in a vintage air system, a nice Kenwood stereo. So they've taken it from that, that cool initial edition and made it even better. I have to eat my words, and maybe the filet that once was inside of the hide inside of this truck. Outside it looks stock, but that, uh, that uh, hair interior, the... the how hide is, is, is amazing, uh, very Texas. Let's take a look here, and there it is. <laughs> how cool is that? Not stock, but I like it. And it's not just looks and uh, stuff they've added to this. They've also done a lot of suspension work. I mean, you can see it's been dropped. It's got dropped spindles. They've done a lot of work. And I, what I love is the fact that they've kept that gentleman gym look because, I mean, you know, yeah, it, it was a cool option in its day, but it really wasn't something that's truly super collectible. So they've taken a neat truck and added a little more style to it. And guess what? It's bringing money in the room, $44,000. Away it goes. All right, right behind it, I think this is the uh, car that uh, April Rose previewed a little while ago, a 1957 BMW Izetta. You know, they've argued that this is the car that kept BMW alive. I mean, between 1955 and 1963, they made 160,000 of these. And what they did, BMW licensed this body style and this design from ESO. 
Now, if you look at the ESO version that initially came out, it's a little bit different than this, but ultimately it's the same basic concept, although this does have a BMW engine. But the cool thing is the way the wheel articulates. You see, if you close that, the wheel comes back in. As you open it, it comes back out. Surprisingly very roomy. What's interesting, too, is that stick shift. It's got a backwards H pattern. So first gear is down and to the right, where normally you would expect it to be up and to the left. And of course, we talk about the fact that it only has a single horsepower, or pardon me, a single cylinder engine hidden underneath there. And the perfect thing is that one of the reasons that the engine is mounted right here on this side is that with a left-hand drive vehicle, the driver is on the left-hand side. So the idea was it would actually balance it, so it was better balanced as a vehicle. And speaking of balance, these are four-wheelers. A lot of folks think this is single wheels. A handful were built that way, but the wheels are so close together in the back, they behave like a single pivot point. But yeah, these are four tires. Well, they made a three-wheeled version of these. They called the Brighton BMW Isettas because for England, it was, mo it was licensed as a motorcycle. But most of these, and especially all the ones that were imported to the United States, were four wheels, $25,000. That's the hammer price. All right, check out a car that's coming up before too long, a 1989 Volkswagen camper van. Got a 1,600cc engine. Dual Solex carburetors, four-speed transmission. It's even got power brakes. We'll see it soon. The all-new line of Barrett Jackson merchandise and apparel is now available. From road rallies to the office, there are many stylish options for the car lover. Available year-round or online at shopbarrettjackson.com. Ah, back here at the South Florida Fairgrounds, the Barrett-Jackson Collector Car Auction from Palm Beach. So much great machinery that's going to be crossing the block. Needless to say, no shortage of Broncos because this has been a Bronco storm this last couple of years. But great trucks as well. And up on the block now, this is the 89 Volkswagen Custom Camper Van that we previewed just a little while ago. Yeah, this one is similar to a West Philly. I'm not sure if that's what it is. This is a 1989, which means it was certainly built for an, a market other than North America. These were probably built and sold in Brazil for many years. But by this point in time, in 89, the Vanagon had taken over for this family of Volkswagen bus. Yeah, I mean, you think about it, the concept of the Volkswagen van, the bus, if you want to call it that, goes back into the 50s. I mean, the fact that they were still building them this, this look in 1989 is absolutely amazing, and, and the fact that it was still holding it. And really, you know, they changed the body style significantly between 67 and 68. From 68 on, it was this bread van look. Let's have a look, of course, as always, the engines in the back. The beauty of that is that there's no engine tunnel. There's no hump in the front between the seats. It's all back here. The rest of the vehicle is purely for moving human beings, 100% efficiency. I love the fact that they took this and made it look like that earlier style. I love the color here on this one. This is lime green, and I love the touches that they did with the wheels. The steel wheel hubcap and the white wall tires. It just sets it off perfectly, and I don't know that we can get inside here, but they've done a beautiful job inside. It has a sink, refrigerator, and a fold-down bed out in the back. A lot of custom work went into that. $33,000 for a 1989 custom camper van. All right, Super Saturday's coming up, and both Craig Jackson and Mike McCullough have been drooling over a car that will be crossing the block. We have a 2020 Ford GT done in triple yellow with black stripes. Nicely optioned, has the carbon fiber wheels on it, titanium lug nuts, titanium exhaust, dark energy interior. The paint has also had a full wrap. I have Mike McCullough with me. Tell us a little bit more about it, Mike. Yeah, the 2020 GT, Ford GTs are amazing vehicles. They're powered by the 3.5 liter uh, EcoBoost twin turbo V6. Puts out 660 horsepower for this year. This vehicle has only been driven just under 1,300 original miles from new. 
They are true race cars, but they also have the creature comforts inside of them. It is coming from the Steve Todd Hunter collection. Great cars to drive, very rare. If you didn't make the original list to get one, this is your opportunity. And that'll be coming up Saturday. Meanwhile, looks like we finally have a new top seller. Check this out. It's a 1965 Nova SS Custom, currently bid to $56,000. Yeah, Resto Mod is the word here. Ford 9-inch rear axle, 383 small block under the hood, and just a really tasteful uh, unichrome color scheme, if you will. No more chrome on this thing, but just really nicely done. Tasteful. Yeah, it's got four link suspension, adjustable coilovers, Willwood disc brakes. Boy, all kinds of great touches and a great look as well. And guess what? The new number one sale of the day. Congratulations to that gentleman right there. $60,000 for a 1965 Nova SS Custom. Now with that, let's take a look at our top five now that it's changed, led the way by that Nova. We've got an MG tied with a Pontiac Catalina. Who would have thought that? We got a Pontiac Trans Am and a Chevy C10, all in our top five. How long will it last that way? Well, we still have a while to go, about another hour and a half of our Barrett Jackson coverage on Thursday. 1966 Olds 442 convertible. Well, it's a true 442. The BAN has a 338 in the beginning. That's the body code for a. 442. This one's slightly modified. The wheels are a little bit later. This still has the original drum brakes front and rear. Of course, disc brakes wouldn't be available on the 442 until 67, but a very rare body style here. Now, this one's interesting. The, the consigner points out this one has a rebuilt salvage title, which is a, it's not one of those that's been involved in a mine or something. This has had something significant that was done to it. Some, whether it was stolen, whether it was an accident, it was hard to say, but there was damage somehow. But I like the fact that they're very upfront about that. And when we're looking at this, you realize almost any car from this generation that's been restored is going to have a lot of work to it. So I don't know that that's really going to significantly hurt the value of this particular car. And you're right, Rick, we don't know, was this car crashed? or was it simply a theft recovery? Uh, that is not indicated on the title. So, as Steve says, if only cars could talk. you got to remember, too, the 442 was actually the same basic chassis as a Chevelle or a GTO, but frankly, about six inches longer. Yeah, Oldsmobile added a lot of length to the body, the front fenders, but underneath this is the same frame and chassis pretty much as a GTO or a Chevelle or a Buick Skylark. But again, Oldsmobile made the body a little bigger. Now that is really long. It looks like a full size, but it's an intermediate. Yeah, I mean, the wheelbase on that's only 115 inches. I mean, it's only about six inches longer, or eight, seven inches longer than a Mustang. But the overall length is 204 inches. A lot of overhang on both the front and the rear. $39,000 for that 1966 Olds 442. And the Summit Racing Soul sticker goes on, and away it goes for 39 grand. It's the first of our first generation Camaros rolling up on the block, a 67 Camaro Custom. Well, you got to remember, the Mustang arrived on April 17th, 1964, and Chevrolet waited, well, three full model years, 1967, to release the Camaro right here. And this one here has been fortified with a 497 cubic inch big block with Edelbrock aluminum cylinder heads, Edelbrock intake, a Holley four-barrel carburetor. Got to be at least 500 horsepower going on here. Hey, think about it, 61 years ago this weekend. Now the VIN on this one begins one, two, four. That means it was born a V8 car. One, two, three would be a six cylinder. But again, that was then. I like what they've done. It's very uh, modern and yet retro. The big wheels and tires give it a 21st century flair, but the rest of it's pretty much oh, 1970 hot rod, Friday night street racer. 
I mean, they were obviously a little bit late to the game. I mean, the Mustang had already been out for a couple of years. They sold less than 200,000 that first year. But when you think about it, it was strong sales. And what I liked about the first generation of Camaro was the fact that underneath it was more forward looking than the first generation of the Mustang. The Mustang was built on the old Falcon chassis. This was built on what was going to be the Nova chassis, but it was the next generation of Nova. So underneath, it's really a much more modern vehicle than the Mustang of the same year. And speaking of underneath, it's good to see with the 496 cubic inch big block, there's a 12 bolt rear axle, which is the big brother to the 10 bolt, which would not live long behind that big 496. And 12 bolt, it'll be just fine. Four eleven gears in the back, good for acceleration. Well, it's broken into our top ten as well. Forty-three thousand dollars for this 1967 Camaro Custom. All right, time for a mid-year Corvette from 1964. This is a 327 cubic inch model. Yeah, second year for the Stingray. Of course, we're, we're freaking out now about the E-Ray, which is electric hybrid drive. Well, in 63 and 4, the independent rear suspension under the Stingray was as newsworthy. <laughs> Crazy but true. But again, by separating the right and left rear tires from each other with the independent suspension, you get better handling. And that's what it was all about. This one is the 300 horsepower, 327, one step up from the 250. Iron intake manifold still. The Carter AFB carburetor in this case here. This one's backed up by the four-speed manual transmission. And you know, this one's a convertible, and frankly, that was more common in 1964. You know, there were a total of 22,000 Corvettes built that year. Only 8,300 of them were the coupes. 13,900 of them were the convertible. So the reality is this is the car that everybody wanted that year. Now the wheels on this one, you might be forgiven. Hey, those are knockoffs. You know, we all know that 1964 was the first year for the ready availability of the knockoff wheel, but these are simulations. They're just hubcaps. You know, it's, it's amazing to think about the philosophy between an illusion of a knockoff like this and the modern Corvette, there's nothing on the new Corvette that doesn't do something. But again, back in the 60s, well, the illusion was half of the picture. Well, I'll tell you what's cool about this one. According to Consigner, it only has 65,000 original miles on the odometer. So when you look at this, I mean, look at the price of $42,000 with only 65,000 original miles. Not bad. And it's not the lowest horsepower engine, not the highest, but still it's got 300 horsepower right in the middle of the pack. A lot of fun with this. Sixty-four, the final year for break for drum brakes all the way around. 1965, you would get disc brakes at the rear, which again was very much a breakthrough in the industry. Well, that is now the number two sale of the day, a 1964 Corvette with just 65,000 original miles, $53,000. We're going to say the Chevrolet family, but much more modern, a 2012 Camaro ZL1, 580 horsepower. Yeah, you know, when the Mustang GT500 hit the scene in 2006, 2007, Camaro had to do something, and that something was the ZL1. Now, ZL1, of course, is a reference to the 1969 aluminum 427 engine, and that engine had a four-barrel carburetor. That was then. This is an aluminum engine here. However, the supercharger on this one makes way more power than the original 430 horsepower 427 ever could. This one's a six-speed manual. It's not modified in any way. It's very pure, and that's the way I like them best. Yeah, the color is ashen gray metallic. You know, I love that fact with a factory rear wing painted to match. It's got black leather, Alcantara interior. Just nicely done all the way across the board. And that six-speed manual, I mean, it is a fact that, you know, the semi-automatics, the electronic shift automatics will shift quicker and faster than you ever can with your left foot and your right hand. But there's nothing like a manual transmission to connect you to a supercharged 6.2-liter V8. 
I mean, this was billed as the killer Camaro in its day. Because, I mean, think about it. 580 horsepower back in 2012. Strong number. Well, there you go. A lot of horsepower for $28,000 from the 2012 Camaro Z01. And, you know, that sale reminds us of a pretty special moment we had in Scottsdale earlier this year with another Z01. This is one of the rarest, best muscle cars. This is the quintessential muscle car right there. $475,000 of the current bid. That alone makes it the number two sale. It's now tied at 485. We have a new number one seller here at Barrett Jackson on Super Saturday. Looked like it was gonna stall around 485, 500. It's still going at $675,000. $700,000, the top seller of the day so far here at Barrett Jackson. Now that was in Scottsdale. Of course, a very rare car, but solid money. And up on the block now, a 1964 Chevrolet Nova. You know, in Spanish, Nova translates to it doesn't go. Well, this one does. Got a 3 stroker, small block. And again, 1964 is the first year for a factory available V8 in Nova. Prior to that, strictly six owner and four owner. $28,000, the hammer price. Remember, our number one sale of the day right now is a Nova SS Custom from 1965. That one not quite as extreme. The 1964 brought solid money here at Barrett Jackson in Palm Beach. Perfect place to spend your spring break with all the great cars that we've got here at the South Florida Fairgrounds. We're going to take a break and come right back. When you come to Barrett Jackson, you get to see some amazing collector cars. But if you're a little adventurous like me, you come down here to the Dodge Thrill Ride, Made up with guys like Rick and hopping something like this. What do we got? Today we got a uh, Charger Red Eye making 797 horsepower. Let's go, Ricky boy. Uh, okay, Rick. Yeah, I got it. Oh, no. Let's go, Rick. Come on. Uh oh. Whoa, oh, 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 oh. Holy moly. Oh. Oh. 97 horsepower. That was crazy. That was fun. That was fun. Did you that like it? Fun for you. That was a little rich hot sauce. <laughs> extra sauce. I put extra sauce on that one. I'll tell you, the best part about that is that's not just a special ride for our crew. If you're out here at Barrett Jackson, they have the thrill rides. Everybody gets to go out and do that. So it's a great opportunity to see just exactly what it's like to get thrown around with 700 horsepower. $25,000, the current bid for a 2009 Cadillac XLR. The XLR shared a lot of stuff with the Corvette, the C6 Corvette of the era, with one key difference, that North Star V8 under the hood, but still had a torque tube with the transmission going to the rear. This one on automatic, obviously very different styling. I think they did a great job with these. And these kind of pick up where the Cadillac Alante left off, but these finally got it right. No more front wheel drive. Again, as you said, Tyler, these have the rear wheel drive setup and some of the Corvette's bones. But again, that North Star is a much higher revving, much higher revving engine than the, uh, the LS could be. Yeah, 320 horsepower. Congratulations to those folks there. It's a pretty cool car. Not a lot of them out there. And the Summit Racing Soul Sticker goes on, and away it goes for $26,000. 1990 Chevy K5 Blazer rolling up on the block. Well, this would be the end of the line of the K5 Blazer, the Blazer that I envision in my head, which started in the early 70s. It had the full roof that comes off, of course, by the 80s, and by 1990, they had the half roof. But nowadays, the Blazer is a crossover SUV, and I think it's kind of a crime that they put that name on a crossover. What do you think? You know, it's funny, everything's coming back. Bronco, Maverick. I wonder if the Pinto and the Vega will ever come back. We'll have to see. Well, and out in the, the Chevy Showcase, which is here, they've got the Blazer EV. 
So they've got the next generation of Blazer as well. Yeah, I would say they did put the full-size Bronco on something that actually has some off-road capability, not a normal crossover. I get that's what people are buying nowadays, but when I think of a Blazer, I think of this. Of course, the fuel-injected 350, you know, big solid axle. And this one's really, really nice, bright red paint. Yeah, we look at the front hub on this, we see the little 4x4 logo and no toggle. In other words, this one has the automatic four-wheel drive, so for once you didn't have to get out and lock in your hubs to put it in the four-wheel drive. That's done inside. And while the Blazer may have come out in reaction to the Bronco, it was a really different vehicle from day one, whereas the Bronco was a short wheelbase built on a very specific chassis. When the Blazer came out, it was like, all right, let's throw it on a truck, tr truck chassis. And in reality, they were looking at the future of what it, be what it became even with the, the Bronco. This one is fuel injected, and no, it's not a tuned port Corvette or Z28 engine. It's basically a throttle body on the 5.7, and that was done for fuel efficiency, emissions, and yeah, drivability. I tell you what, a lot of fun just sold for $17,000. A 1990 Chevrolet K5 Blazer with that 5.7 liter V8 engine, automatic transmission. Away it goes. 1972 Chevy Monte Carlo up in the block. Well, the final year for the first generation of Monte Carlo, 70, 71, and 72. Often forgotten is the fact these have an extra four inches of wheelbase versus a Chevelle, and these have a unique frame. It's all about John DeLorean's desire to have the longest hood possible in the industry. And again, 1972, final year for the first gen Monte Carlo. This one has a 350 under the hood, and I believe, I wouldn't think this is a factory color, but they did a great job with the repaint. Very nice body. Of course, the build aluminum wheels look great on the Monte Carlos as well. Yeah, my YouTube channel, the Steve Mags Junkyard Crawl, a little junkyard spotter's tip. If you find a Monte Carlo, the front disc brakes are standard and they bolt right on to a Chevelle of 1970s. So if you spot a Monte, more often than not, the front discs have been scavenged already. But again, these have 12 bolt or 10 bolt rear axles, depending on the engine. This one has a J code. It was born a 352 barrel, as most of them were. Monte Carlo, of course, very successful in the NASCAR world, and the reason being it had a 116-inch wheelbase, which was just one inch longer than the minimum required. You know, the Chevelle wheelbase wouldn't do it, but this was perfect, and they were very successful in their day. It was always very interesting to me in NASCAR that they hung on to the Monte Carlo as long as they did and didn't switch to the Camaro because, of course, after this a few generations, they went with the front-wheel drive, 3.4 liters. Uh, they didn't have near the performance of the NASCAR vehicle when they had the Camaro that they could have switched to. I wonder why they didn't do that. I think NASCAR saw the Camaro as a pony car, and they wanted a, a sedan, a passenger car, crazy but true, the Chevelle, et cetera. Now, these do have a NASCAR history, I believe, Junior Johnson. Uh, they had a Coca-Cola, gold, red, beautiful-looking car. NASCAR, Monte Carlo, Google that. There were some mean machines. And, of course, NASCAR and the Mustang world have changed since those days. So uh, it's amazing how time changes things as we go along. You can't forget the Monte Carlo SS, which could be had with a 350 four-speed, a 450 automatic, and uh, there was a muscle version. Well, there we go, $15,000. Not a bad price for a very cool car, a 1972 Chevrolet Monte Carlo. It's got the 350 cubic inch small block V8. Barrett-Jackson.com is the place to go if you want to get more information about the cars that are crossing the block, both today and over the next two days. In fact, you can research cars that have already crossed the block, so it's a great place to get a lot of information. You can see it's raining. It was beautiful weather earlier today, but we got an afternoon thunderstorm, which is not uncommon here in Florida this time of year. Up on the block right now, how about a 1972 Volvo 1800E? Now, Rick, this one is known as Roger, and I'm sure you have a sense of why it might be called Roger, right, guys? I know, but does Tyler know? Roger Moore, the saint. Great no, James Bond, right? Proud of, you. proud of you, young man. Now, as the story goes, the producers of the saint went to Jaguar to ask them for a car, and they said, absolutely not. At the time, Roger Moore had a Volvo 1800, and he said, why don't we just use my car? And then, here we have it. 
wonderful car. This one has had a four-year restoration on the body. It's had $43,000 put into it. It's all original. All of the engine, all of the dash interior. It's immaculate. Yeah, these are pretty iconic. They're known for their styling, which was Italian from Ghia. But then also, Volvos of this area were so well built. I believe that one of these had the record for the most miles driven, 2.4 million miles. Someone in the United States before he dry, uh, died or retired the car. But these are fantastic machines. You know, I like to look at the brag tags. The E here indicates the P1800 electronic, or electric, it's a fuel injection car. There you go, electronic fuel injection. And that's different from the carburetor seen on lesser versions. And of course, automatic, which you and I might snarl at. Well, it was that brag tag. The automatic made clutchless driving a possibility for whoever owned this car new. And the other thing that the automatic did there, Steve, is that that was a very rare spec on this car. There was around or under 2,000 in the automatic, and, and it makes it very rare. And while it looks like a sports car, it really wasn't. It was just a cool-looking car. But my favorite one, by the way, is the P1800 ES, the station wagon-looking version. Well, that one just sold for $38,000. And coming up, check this out, a 1960 DeSoto Fireflight sedan, 361 cubic inches, V8. It's got power steering, power brakes, push-button AM, everything you want. Consign now to join the world-class collector vehicles already in the lineup for Barrett Jackson's 2023 Las Vegas event. June 22nd through the 24th in the West Hall of the Convention Center. Sell your car where the bidders are. Back here at the South Florida Fairgrounds, a little bit of rain hitting outside. Perfect chance to go inside and look at all the cars in the showcase collection. Those are some of the cars that will be crossing the block later this week. A lot of them on Super Saturday because they're pretty spectacular pieces of machinery. Back inside the auction arena, we've got a 1955 Ford Crown Victoria Skyliner. Well, the Skyliner was new for 55, and it says here glass tops. It's a bit of an incorrect. These are actually plexi. It's not actual glass, 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 but it is tinted and a very cool futuristic show car thing right in your driveway for 1955. You can't imagine many people optioning that out when you didn't have air conditioning. That would kind of be kind of a tough sell, as cool as it looks, uh, but definitely gives that grease lightning look, but I guess it was under the hood in the grease car. This one, a very, very nice restoration. I believe the stock V8 under the hood, but you see the custom wheels. Otherwise, very stock, nice looking car. And beyond the uh, Skyliner option, this is also a Crown Victoria, and the punchline there is the chrome band, which Ford called the tiara top, kind of like the Queen's tiara, if you will, but Crown Victoria could be had with a solid roof or this, the plastic translucent roof. So that color is called Tropical Rose, and it is an original color from 1955. If you ordered this car brand new, you could get Tropical Rose. That's not a custom color. I'm not sure many cars could really carry off Tropical Rose and Black Two-Tone on the interior and exterior, but I think it looks great in that. Absolutely does. And think about what a significant year 1955 was in automotive design. You know, you had the 55 Chevy, you had the 55 Chrysler that came out with that forward look. Everything was so amazing in 1955, and this is a perfect example of it. $29,500 for a 1955 Ford Crown Victoria Skyliner. All right, we've got a little bit of a problem. Right now, we've got a Pontiac Firebird roll up on a block, and they started to introduce a 79 Rolls Royce Silver Wrath. They're like, all right, we're going to go with a Pontiac instead. So we got a 67 Pontiac Firebird convertible up on the block. Well, the Pontiac Firebird dynasty begins right here, 67. Of course, it's the F platform, which also underpinned the Camaro. And Pontiac, at this point in time, had their own engines. This is the 326, not related to the Chevy 327, which could be had in a Camaro. The 326 was purely Pontiac. Really nice restoration on this one, of course, being a convertible, sharing the body with the Camaro. Sort of the Krieger SS looking wheels, BFG tires. It's a really sharp driver here. Yeah, and again, debut year right here, Firebird. The convertible, a very uncommon body style. And if we could open the 
trunk or engine compartment on any Camaro or fiber convertible, you'll see something called a cocktail shaker. It's about a 40 pound canister that's filled with oil and a heavy mass that was designed to tune out cowl shake. In other words, it's called a band-aid if you're an engineer, but with that said, they're added weight. Most people remove them. That's about 110 pounds of dead weight, but it helped the car not shake as much. Well, I mean, you can give them a little bit of a pass because they're redesigning these cars pretty much every year, whereas nowadays they have 10, 15 years on a chassis before they completely redo it. So, obviously, uh, well, you can give them a pass. Yeah, no computer simulations in 1967. But with that said, what a beautiful design. The pony car, again, Mustang started it all in 1965 model year. Long hood, short deck, sporty fun car, and boy, did they create a market segment, and Pontiac filled it with this. $23,000 for that 1967 Pontiac Firebird convertible. Well, tune into the History Channel to see some of the most exciting automotive innovations of the future today. Five entrepreneurs will battle it out for $100,000 in cash and prizes. It's SEMA Launchpad, and it prepares on Saturday, April 15th at 9 a.m. Eastern Time on the History Channel. Make sure you tune in. Don't forget, we are on the History Channel for seven hours of live action auction here at Barrett-Jackson on Saturday. $25,000 the current bid for a 1971 Corvette. Oh, they weren't all 454s. They weren't all tri-powers. Of course, 1970 was the year that the 350 could be had. The 454 could be had. This one's a base 350, flat hood car. Got a four-speed, but it's a nice numbers-matching example. Yeah, 270 horsepower was the bottom of the horsepower range. I mean, you could work your way up to 425 horsepower. But when you think about it, it was still pretty solid for its day. And when you had the looks, you know, and it was proven a few years later when the horsepower dropped tremendously, as long as you had the looks, people were still interested in the car. $34,000 for a 1971 Corvette with that 350, 270 horsepower engine. All right, a little while ago, April previewed this pickup truck. It's a 1971 Chevy C10 Cheyenne, nicknamed Buttercup. Yeah, I get it with the, the butter yellow paint and the white. It would shine yellow on the bottom of your chin if it was a flower. This one has 400 cubic inch logos on the front fenders. But we know better than that. This actually is the 402, which was the 396 with 60,000s overboard. Confused yet? But anyway, big block power from the factory, automatic transmission. The wheels in this are a little bit more modern. These are late 70s pieces, but a classic add-on. And this is a long bed, half-ton, two-wheel drive. Short beds are a little more desirable, but frankly, if you wanted to work a truck, like this, not that you would, the long bed is far more useful with its eight foot load floor. This one is a half tonner. The rear suspension is coil springs. Yep, coil springs under a Chevy pickup truck, a Dodge or a Ford pickup at this point. We have leaf springs in the back. But with that said, these would carry about as much weight but give you a slightly nicer ride going down the road on the way to the farm. You know, these were called the action line trucks. This basic style came out in 1967, lasted for about five years. This was getting toward the end of the run. But, you know, sometimes they're also called the glamour trucks because the idea was they were getting more appealing healing from a styling perspective. So, you know, this thing with that buttercup look really was that next generation of starting to think, okay, we want a truck that's more than just utilitarian. utilitarian. We want it to look nice. And getting into 1973 with the advent of the square body, they came with the 454 as an option. But at this point in time, the 402 was the biggest V8 you could get. $24,000. Way it goes, $24,000 for a 1971 Chevrolet C10 Cheyenne pickup truck. Love the way it's all put together. Less than 60,000 original miles. Out in the McGuire staging lanes, no shortage of uh, great cars that are lining up. The question is, what do you like? You like it old? You like it new? You like it... Muscle, you like a sports car? We got them all coming across the block during the course of our Thursday coverage of the Barrett Jackson Collector Car Auction. Just about an hour left. There's still plenty of vehicles left across the block, like this 1975 Chevy C10 custom pickup truck. 
Well, often forgotten is this depth side bed, which we see in this one here, six foot with exposed, uh, you know, it's kind of a narrow piece with the lumpy uh, rear fender additions, but a 454 under the hood, something you could actually get in a half tonner if you wanted. And with no weight on the back, you're talking about tire smoke. But again, pretty radically modified. The suspension's been lowered quite a bit. Disc brakes front and rear, lowered springs, but beautiful mild deep black paint. You know, this was really the third generation of the CK series. You know, this generation started in 1973 by 1975. You know, it was really in its full line. Some people call it the, the rounded line or the box body, the square body. In many ways, it was really the next generation, the modern generation of pickup truck that we finally saw arrive on the scene. A rustic feature on the step side is the way the tailgate is latched. There's no center, there's no spring loaded, nothing. Just pins and chains. <laughs> the only bum with these chains is ordinary. These would have a, a plastic coating on them. So when they go back, they don't wear through the paint. With that said, uh, the step side would have a much more uh, elegant tail lamp or tailgate solution. Yeah, because it's not going to take long before those things start digging into the paint. $25,000 for a 1975 Chevy C10 custom pickup truck with a 454 cubic inch engine. Well, don't forget to tune in to our Super Saturday coverage at 11 a.m. Eastern time on the History Channel. And whether you're a true history buff or you just tune in for episodes of your favorite series, the History Store is your one-stop shop for exclusive and official History Channel gear. Shop now and get your piece of history at historystore.com. Up the block now, a 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner. Well, the uh, third model year for the mighty Roadrunner, 68, 69, 70, and the final year in this styling cycle. Uh, this one has the standard Roadrunner bulge hood. It does not have the air grabber, which is an optional door that would open up right here and grab the air. This one's a 383 four-speed car. Something new for 1970 was down the side, those dust trail decals as an option, as was the faux scoop in the quarter panel, also seen 1970. Gotta like the uh, 3M reflective tape used for the tail stripe. If you hit this with a flashlight, this turns white at night. It was regarded as a safety feature as well as a marketing touch. Brilliant stuff. Yeah, I like the look on this one all the way around. I love the fact that it's got those Keystone Krager wheels wrapped up with the nice tires. So it's got a, just a slightly custom look to it, although for the most part, it's pretty stock with a 383 cubic inch engine. We'll take a look at that pistol grip four speed right there. First year, 70. And why do they call it a pistol grip? You figure it out. And, you know, the simple goal was to make a simple car, right? I mean, the idea was that, you know, you didn't want to spend a lot of money on making a fancy car or a performance car. The people, the younger crowd who were buying a car couldn't afford that. So the idea was let's make it simple. Strip as much as we can out, but give it the performance. And thus the Roadrunner was born. Wow, bringing big money, $62,000, the current bid. If it sells at that, that'll make it the top seller of the day. Now, the beauty of the Roadrunner is you can tell this from a satellite or a Belvedere. The BIN spells it out. If you see an RM in the first two spots, it's a Roadrunner. We got that right here. Well, they backed the bid up by $2,000. The result is it's now tied at number two. Congratulations. Yeah, you had to duke it out with the bidders, but you won. Let's check in with Tyler Hoover. I'm with lot 139, a 1965 Ford Mustang convertible. And with the Blueprint engine cam, let's take a look under the hood. It's actually something you don't see very often anymore. It is an inline six. Yeah. Yes, the base motor, 200 cubic inch, it has a 170 cubic inch sticker on there, but I believe it's the 200 cubic inch inline six that I imagine a lot of them had when they were new. They sold half a million of these in 1965. This one only 120 horsepower, but these much more efficient, much more simple to work on. You can see there's only a few accessories on there, like the alternator, the power steering, the fan, and that's it. But it's cool to see. Most of them have 289s. They've been swapped with Coyotes, everything else. This one is stock and how it came more or less new, but still a beautiful restoration. Thanks, Tyler. You know, a few years ago, I was judging a car show, and we actually gave the top prize to a six-cylinder. And we were so impressed that they've done such a great job restoring that six-cylinder Mustang. $37,000, the current bid on a 71 Pontiac GTO Custom. 
Well, it really is a GTO. The good news in Pontiac land was the VIN will tell you all you got to know. It says 242 in the first three spots. Yeah, it's a GTO, which, of course, it means at least 400 cubic inches. And this one here has been given a uh, an upgrade with 400 horsepower. Looks like an aftermarket intake. Got some aftermarket buckets, discs in the back, but it's a real GTO. And the consigner points out that they've done the judge theme. So if we go down the side, you'll see those judge stripes to, to give it that same look from a judge car, although this once again was not a judge, at least as far as we know. But it's a real deal GTO that's been customized. 400 cubic inch engine, 400 horsepower under the hood. $37,000. 1978 Camaro Z28 up on the block. You know, it's hard to believe that Chevrolet dropped the Z28 in 75 and 76 and halfway through 77. Meanwhile, Pontiac Trans Am sales exploded. So for 77, half Halfway in, so said, let's bring that thing back. So for 78, this plastic scoop arrived on the scene. It doesn't do anything, nor did the shaker on the Trans Am. This is blocked off, but you know what this does? It sells cars. Yeah, I mean, they sold 272,000 Camaros that year. So it was pretty darn popular when you're realizing, you know, everything else that was being sold. And, you know, really the numbers were slowly but surely going up. It was, it was a solid seller for its day. You know, we got to remember the 1970s that it, the auto industry was reeling from the, the environmental thing, the, the fuel efficiency thing, all of these emissions, all that stuff. So they were basically on their heels, and we called it the simulated 70s, wherein things were, you know, sort of simulated with stripes and plastic. <laughs> the hardware was lacking, but, you know, the cars still had style, and people bought them up. Compared to today, the E-Ray, cars like that are like buying a jet fighter. So it's an amazing thing we've come so far. But these cars are important bricks in the chimney. I love them. Well, don't forget, you could still get a six-cylinder. I mean, we were just talking about the six-cylinder Mustang that's going to follow it, but you could still get a six-cylinder Camaro in this era. And once again, when it drove by, people didn't know there was a six-cylinder underneath. I have to admit, I'm a little confused about whether, is this a real deal Z28? Because the consigner is calling it a Z28, but saying it has gray Z28 bra graphics on it. Well, I see the L in the fifth spot, which is a Z28 350, so it's a Z28. There you go, the, VIN, the VIN doesn't lie. 1978 Camaro Z28. You know, and that's just one of the full generation of Camaros that we can actually see right here on the grounds at Barrett-Jackson Palm Beach. So Steve Bagnanti went out to give us a little tour of Camaro history. When the Ford Mustang came out in 1964 and a half, Chevrolet had no competition. Well, that changed. By 1967, the Chevy Camaro was born and was built from 67 through 69 in its first generation. The ball was just getting rolling. As Camaro moved into the 1970s, the second generation arrived in 1970 and was built through 1981. These were not available as convertibles. However, these could be had with big blocks, small blocks, and in Z28 form were known as the Hugger. 1982 brought the third generation Camaro with downsizing, but an advent in the form of fuel injection and overdrive manual and automatic transmissions for fuel economy. But the best of the breed was the IROC Z, the international race of champions. The fourth generation Camaro arrived in 1993 through 2002 and brought in some innovations that included plastic fenders and doors and the advent of the mighty LS Gen 3 small block Chevy engine family. For 2010, Chevrolet dropped the fifth generation Camaro, and it was actually the most technologically advanced of the breed so far. Independent rear suspension instead of the beam axle, and even the six cylinder cars had 306 horsepower. The V8s started at 400 horsepower, but it wasn't over yet. Which brings us to the current sixth generation Camaro, the most technologically and performance dense Camaro yet. The base four cylinder has 275 horsepower, and the big ZL1 has 650 horsepower and 650 foot-pounds of torque. It doesn't get much better than this. Now, the word is that Camaro's going out of production in about a year. And we have to wonder, Ford just doubled down on the new Mustang. Will Camaro come back as a seventh generation? We'll just have to wait and see.
And what GM and Chevrolet has said is that the Camaro name is not likely to go away. So are we going to see something, for example, like the uh, the Mustang E, you know, in terms of bringing out an electric power? I think that's very likely. And will it be sort of a low slung SUV? Makes sense. Fascinating to see how the manufacturers are reinventing these wonderful marks, Camaro, Ma Mustang and others, for the future in different incarnations. We, instead of having a, you know, like we've got a Mach-E, how about an E28? I can see that coming. Uh, I haven't trademarked it yet. I see Chevrolet on the horizon. Up, up on the block now, how about a 1965 Ford Galaxy 500 convertible? Well, 65 was a big year for the big Ford. They finally went from leaf springs in the back in 64 to coil springs in the back for 65. Kind of copying the GM playbook. Let's face it, coil springs give you a cushier ride, potentially, than a stiffer leaf spring. This one's a 390-equipped car with the uh, automatic transmission. A 390 cubic inch V8 on this one as well. Of course, being the convertible, I think this is the body style to have with the Galaxy. It just looks fantastic. Otherwise, the coupe's I mean, it's a little long. This is a car that you can put six people in. Drag Douglas, I'm in Wichita, Kansas. That's what you would do in a car like this. Drag Douglas and uh, meet two people. Yeah, this is the Z-Code 394 barrel. It's a 300 horsepower engine, nominally rated, uh, very mellow hydraulic cam, small four barrel, zero maintenance, plenty of torque. You could get the 427, the R-Code dual quad with 425 horsepower in a full size Ford if you really wanted it, but few people did in 1965. I tell you what, I love this car. At $21,500, beautiful convertible, resale red, big engine. This is a great car. I'm only sorry so I'm up here talking about it and not waving my bidders pass. I would love to drive around in that thing. What a great looking car. 1960 DeSoto Fireflight. This is one we previewed a little while ago when we were going to a commercial break. It's got that tricolor red, black, and white interior, shell wide on the outside. And God, I call that the baleen whale front. Well, you know, DeSoto, a lot of people don't even remember, was a division of the Chrysler Corporation, and it was uh, unplugged in 1961, but came along in the mid-30s and kind of was uh, Chrysler's Pontiac and Oldsmobile fighter above jo a Dodge, but below Chrysler. And look at that beautiful grill there, of course, all the chrome work. Very, very of the late 50s, even though this is a 1960, but they were trying some new technology. If you look inside, it actually has a push-button transmission. Excuse me, sir. Right inside here, take a look. What you're seeing now a lot in modern cars, he really wants to see inside that car. But of course, in 1960, they were doing this with Edsel, they were doing this with DeSoto. Um, I believe it's a little more unreliable with the Edsels, right? Well, I gotta say, these were cable operated. The Edsel actually was electric, and these were kind of bulletproof. But one thing that's interesting, I call that the rib raker rear view mirror because <laughs> there's no seat belts. And as you make your way through the windshield, that rakes your ribs like a xylophone on the way out. I'm kidding, I'm joking. But with that said, Today, there's no way in heck that a rear view mirror mounted flat on the instrument panel would ever pass muster. And plus, if people are sitting in the back, you can't see through the window. But you know what? It's very stylish, and that's what it was all about. Well, and they say DeSoto and Imperial, they were a few years behind when it came to the styling, which you can kind of see here. We're in a 1960, but we still have some really big fins. I love the way it looks, though. I mean, it's not quite a 45-degree angle there, but it's definitely unique. It almost looks cartoonish when you get right down to it. It is so wild looking. Tell you what, $17,000 for a 1960 DeSoto Fireflight. All that style, all that sheet metal, and away it goes. The all-new line of Barrett Jackson merchandise and apparel is now available. From road rallies to the office, there are many stylish options for the car lover. Available year-round or online at shopbarrettjackson.com. We're back here at the Barrett Jackson Collector Auction in Palm Beach, and up on the block, we got a 2008 Mercedes-Benz S550. 
Now, the S-Class was designed for the 2007 model year. This is the 2008, the second year. But I think they knocked it out of the park with these. They look pretty aggressive. They sort of have flared fenders on the front and rear. It looks really aggressive. This one being the base model, the S550. It doesn't have all-wheel drive. It's not the AMG. But I thought it had a really great presence over the previous body. Now, Tyler, the YouTube creator, question. Um, <laughs> you've owned a few of these, correct? Good power, or are they too heavy for their own good? Oh, no, the power's fantastic. Of course, the V8, the base model's plenty. I had the S600, a 2007, with the V12 twin turbo with a quick tune. It was 600 horsepower, 700 torque, which is pretty fantastic. But it did share a few things with this. The panoramic roof is a really nice touch with these. This one does have a few nice options. You can see inside it has one of the early uh, full screen speedometers, but also you could flick it over and would have full night vision if you ever get inside and take a look at one of these. It's a very neat feature for 2008. A lot of people get concerned about technologically dense cars. Is it warranted, or do these things hang in there pretty good, the electronics? I mean, there's probably a, a computer for a module for a lot of things, but the nice thing about it is there's not much guesswork when things are wrong. You, they can all can talk to each other. It reads out the codes, and you replace it. If you have the right computer to program things, if you're putting in a new module or such, it's really not that bad. It makes the diagnostics easier. The cost of the parts, a little higher. I'll tell you what, all that luxury, all that power just sold for $12,000 here at Barrett-Jackson, a 2008 Mercedes-Benz S550. We're only behind it, a 2003 Mercedes-Benz SL500 R Roadster. Oh, this was a pretty revolutionary SL class for Mercedes. They, they had a lot of new things. The biggest one was the uh, retractable hard top. So no longer did you have to fiddle with two tops. Like every generation of Mercedes SL before this, you had the full hard top for year-round performance so you could just put down a touch of the button. I don't think I've ever seen one, though, with a bra on it. That, that is definitely a throwback to a different time. I guess you're protecting the paint with it. Never seen that before. Well, yeah, now we have... Now we have clear bras instead of the old school style. You know, there was once upon a time we had all these vinyl versions. No, from the school of unintended consequence, a lot of time the bra would actually buff it and actually bleach through the clear coat. It sometimes did as much damage as it did good. Now these little wings, these dams here, apparently apply down force. But in the old days, I remember a lot of people put a bra in a car, take it off a year later and realize they'd sandblasted the nose of their car. Another cool feature these have are the ABC suspension, which is an active hydraulic system, which made them great performers for touring, which mostly you want to tour around the beach. Say you're in Palm Beach and wanted to cruise down to the Florida Keys. A great car for that. But then you can hit the buttons, uh, up the dampening, and you have a really good sports car as well. Which for its day was pretty unusual. Today, boy, tons of cars will do that. By the way, one weird thing about the bras, those vinyl bras we used to put, do, use back in those days, they're great, but don't let them get wet. They can discolor the paint underneath. So it's great to prevent rock chips. Well, not great. It was great in its day. Now, I, I, but don't let them get wet. And once again, now you've got some clear vinyl, or better yet, just use a uh, modern finish that'll make sure that you don't get that on there. $17,000. Well, All right, Corvette time, 1982, powered by a Crossfire injection L83 V8 5.7 liter engine. Well, here it is, a one-year vehicle. If you have a Corvette collection, you really should have one of these. It's the one year that the Crossfire injection was standard on all Corvettes, including the collector's edition, which this is not one of. Now, the Crossfire, some people call it the ceasefire, but it consisted of two throttle bodies mounted on a Crossram manifold. They only made them for one year in this body style, and in 84, they also appeared and were gone for 85. They couldn't have been that good. Yeah, they were given a bad reputation, but really they were doing their best to try and find horsepower in an era where it was very hard with emissions restrictions and regulations and such. And, you know, of course, one side feeds the other. I'm sure Max will explain it better than me now that it's open. Here it is. The bottom side of the hood has this little lip that feeds atop the opening in the cross ram. And yeah, indeed, this side feeds that side, just like a 69 Z28 cross ram. But again, there's a single barrel throttle body in here. It's electronic fuel injection, but it's not as free breathing as the tune port stuff that arrived in 1984. The good news is when it worked, it was up to 205 horsepower. Now, we consider that pretty anemic today, but in 1982, that was strong power. But going back to your point, when it worked properly. 
this being the final year, it did get a really neat treatment with the paint, I think. When, towards the end, these were very attractive. One thing I did notice on the inside, if you ever do get in, uh, they had the front seat folded down to where you could actually haul some cargo as well. It folds completely flat. $13,000 for a 1982 Corvette with that 5.7 liter V8 engine, 205 horsepower. Great paint. Tyler's dead on for that one. All right, we're going to take a break here at the Barrett Jackson Collector Auction, but still a few cars left across the block. some rain that came just a little while ago here in Palm Beach, but it's gone. Now it looks like the sun's starting to come back out and we can start to enjoy the cars outside again. And they don't have to do quite as much work to wipe them off before they get up onto the block. They're out there in the staging lanes. We'll see them up here very soon. Right now we got a 1957 Pontiac Star Chief Custom Coupe up on the block. Well, Star Chief and Pontiac were at General Motors Division, as was Chevrolet. And if this greenhouse looks familiar to owners of 57 Chevy Bel Airs, it's because it's the same part. GM had the B-body platform, which is used throughout, but the Pontiac has a longer wheelbase and, of course, entirely different quarter panels, suspension, and fenders, and engines. But that said, the Pontiac engine in this one's been replaced by a Chevy 350. So I guess this one's come full circle. The Star Chief name first came out in 1954. <laughs> that first generation was technically only one year. Then 55, 56, 57, that was the second generation. But it's a very distinctive body style. And, you know, in many ways, it preceded the look of the, uh, the, the mid-year mid Chevrolets that came out. Yeah, very similar in many ways. Again, the glass is interchangeable in the greenhouse. Of course, the greenhouse being everything above the, uh, the belt line. But again, the Pontiac quarters are longer. The frame's even different. So they're really not the same otherwise. $13,000 for a 1957 Pontiac Star Chief. You know, every time that guy's purchased a car today, he does that same little Muhammad Ali move. So it's kind of fun. Going up behind it. Something we haven't seen in a long time, a 1992 Chevy Beretta GT. I graduated from Clark University in Worcester, Mass. in 1986, went to work at George Ragsdale Chevrolet in Spencer, Massachusetts, and I remember when these were new. Now, Chevrolet introduced the Beretta as a 1988 model in 1986. Yeah, they had a time machine, I guess, but one of the party tricks on the Beretta was the beer tap door handle right here. You pull it down just like a tap at a bar and you open a door. So in other words, they don't have the more traditional pull handle. But again, front wheel drive, Berettas were strictly two doors and, uh, you know, a fairly popular car in its time. Yeah, I mean, it was a solid mid-class car and they actually did some racing with these, so they had a little bit of fun with them as well. It was a, once again, it was a car that when we go back to the types of cars people actually drove in and the production numbers for these, a lot of people enjoyed them. Yeah, the early ones had the 2.8 liters, 90 to 60 degree V6. This one had the 3.1, the biggest. There were never any V8s in these, of course, no diesels, not even a turbo, I don't think. So these were fairly, fairly mundane, but they were sporty. This one here has an early application of anti-lock braking system, ABS. Well, there it goes, 1992 Chevrolet Beretta, $5,000. And you think about it, what a great way to get into the sport for $5,000. And, you know, we call these modern classics, right? Because it's a new generation of classics. So we have our new generation of collector, Tyler Hoover. Check them out. 
Classics and Customs will always have a big showing here at Barrett Jackson, but where they're having to make a little bit more room here in the auction tents is for what they're calling modern classics. Cars from my generation that are starting to get much bigger collector appeal, like this 2002 Pontiac Trans Am. This one, the collector's edition, the last year of the Trans Am with the big Ram Air hood, that snout nose, feeding the LS engine and a six-speed manual transmission. This one, only 1,000 original miles. But as we go down the row, here's some modern Mopars, starting with a 2000 Plymouth Prowler. This, of course, made Chip Foose famous because he pinned this design, but then Chrysler decided to build it to experiment with bonded aluminum. This one having a V6 engine, 253 horsepower, once again, really low mileage, like 1,600 miles. Now, next to it, a 2009 Dodge Challenger. You would think, well, that's a normal used car, but this one, really nice. One owner, Hemi, six speed, low mileage, and well, since they're not making the Hemi Challenger anymore, no more V8s, I think this is an instant classic. Next to it, a 2007 Mustang. You think a used car, well, this one's actually pretty special. It's a Boss 302 Parnelli Jones Edition. Celine built this as a tribute to the legendary race car. Amazing machine. What I love about modern classics is you get all of the modern conveniences like air conditioning, safety features, that kind of stuff, but still have that old analog experience with a manual transmission, that old school fun. It's a perfect blend of old and new and something you really want to watch here as values increase on modern classics. Yeah, I love pointing out all those cars. And up on the block, something we've never seen before or very rarely seen, a 75 AMC Ambassador Matador Oleg Cassini Edition. Yeah, this is actually a Matador. The Ambassador was a different creature. But you might ask, what was AMC thinking in the mid-'70s with the OPEC oil crisis? A massive car. But again, these are just a product of their times. I'm sure that American Motors was caught unaware. This car was on the drawing board. The world changed, and they were stuck. These are interesting cars, very much an orphan man, but coming on strong is an odd machine now. I tell you what, $5,500, you're going to take this to a car show and you're going to be the only one there because how many people have an Oleg Cassini AMC Ambassador? Wow, very cool. We'll be right back. Consign now to join the world-class collector vehicles already in the lineup for Barrett Jackson's 2023 Las Vegas event. June 22nd through the 24th in the West Hall of the Convention Center. Sell your car where the bidders are. Welcome back to Palm Beach. Well, if you'd like to try and sharpen your bidding skills and perhaps snag a great prize in the process, you'll want to play Fantasy Bid brought to you by Dodge. And right now, April Rose is going to preview one of the cars on which you get to predict the price. Are we good? Check this out. 1968 Bronco. Absolutely stunning resto mod. I love the stock body and what they did right here, a uh, pinstriping detail around the headlights, even more pinstriping down the side. And you got the Bronco just kicking that logo right there. It is so, so cool. Now it's got a fuel injected 302 rebuilt manual transmission, billet accent, stainless steel, shorty headers there, and a really, just a really nice build. It's got two and a half inch lift, one inch body lift, and inside is just pristine. I love the finish too. It's that heritage GT colors, just a really stunning ride. Well, thanks, April. And that Bronco will cross the block this Saturday. So what you want to do is you want to go to promo.barrettjacksonfantasybid.com for the official rules. Who knows? You could be the person who walks away with the grand prize, a 2023 Dodge Charger. Back up on the auction block, a 1964 Chevy Corvair Monza. Well, a very special car and significant car in many ways. This is the final year right here for something called the swing axle in Corvair, something that tucked over and gave these cars a bad rap for handling. 65, they brought a double jointed suspension and made things better. But this is kind of weird. This is a factory air conditioned car. Uh, very uncommon to see a flat six with air conditioning in Corvair land, a very unusual car. Four speed manual transmission, too. You know what's amazing to me is when you look at the Corvair design, you know, and it's so radical for what Chevrolet was doing rear engine air cooled they were thinking about this car they were working on this concept at the same time they were doing those big late 50s cars those big behemoths thinking okay this is going to be the future of the chevrolet world 
indeed a very brave engineering decision, an air-cooled aluminum flat six-cylinder engine in the back. I mean, how brave was that in 1960? They watched that the, the, the Volkswagen was hitting a particular market, although even then it wasn't as popular as it was about to be. But once again, you're right, absolutely a brave decision, one that ultimately probably didn't pan out, but I give him credit for trying. $10,500 for that Corvair Monza. 2012 Mercedes-Benz GL450. Well, yeah, you know, the SUV craze took off in America and spread all over the globe. And this is Mercedes-Benz bid. Uh, it's far more expensive and luxurious than any Ford or GM product. But with that said, um, it's a fantastic piece, the G-Wagon. This is not the supercharged version. This is the more pedestrian version, not the military piece. But again, just a, an exquisite, comfortable vehicle to ride around in. Uh, you, know, you have to remember, in the United States, we tend to think of Mercedes as being, you know, purely luxury. But in Germany, there were a lot of these that were much simpler, much more basic. You know, a lot of the Mercedes that we equate as simply being luxurious over there, well, you could get them stripped down. They weren't as, as luxurious as we're used to with diesel engines, that type of thing. That's right. Don't confuse this with an AMG. This one's a you know a fairly uh, modest vehicle. Again, it's attractive, but narrow wheels, same size front and back, so you can rotate them if you choose to. Of course, you could get an AMG version as well. This one just sold here at Barrett Jackson for twelve thousand dollars. Let's check in with Tyler Hoover. I'm with lot one five six, a two thousand one Honda S two thousand, and with the blueprint engine cam, let's take a look under the hood of this sports car icon right here, two liter four cylinder, and you can see it's mounted back from the shocks here. So basically a mid in an engine, even though it's in the front, two liter, four cylinder, 240 horsepower. So the power to weight ratio in this little car is actually pretty good. But the big claim to fame with these, especially the early ones, they called them the AP1, is the high red line, almost 9,000 RPM. And my favorite touch is on the inside with the instrument cluster. You can see they set it up sort of like an Indy or a Formula One car with the way that rev counter goes all the way across it. This one also showing 170,000 miles on the odometer, but the car certainly doesn't look at really nice shape. I yeah, absolutely love the S2000, and that car has a strong, strong following. All right, let's check in with Christian Murphy. Thank you very much, Rick. I am down here with a gentleman who run the show, Craig Jackson, chairman and CEO, Steve Davis, the president. 20 years in Palm Beach and never a dull moment. We had wonderful sunshine and heat, a downpour, all sorts of things happening. Another memorable day there, Craig. Very much so, sort of like we talked about coming on the air. Very eclectic. Uh, Corvair just came over, as Steve talked earlier, before we went on the, the uh, Pinto. There's a, just an eclectic mix, which is really become a trademark of Palm Beach, especially Thursday. Absolutely. I mean, the leaderboard had lots of Corvettes and, and a Catalina, a, a Roadster made some good money. Looking forward, what can we expect to see tomorrow? Because there's some great things coming. Absolutely. As always, the price of poker goes up on Friday, then we take it to the uh, a pinnacle on Saturday. But still the signature Barry Jackson mix, but we have some great, great cars. We have a tribute Eleanor edition. We have some really great stuff you'd expect to see Saturday prime time we stuck in on Friday so it'll going to be awesome and then we're going to work our way into the Ford GTs and the European supercars and all the incredible things we have lined up something for everybody Barrett Jackson's signature docket is going to rock boys we cannot thank you enough for putting it all together it's been a wonderful first day but tomorrow well Rick tomorrow it's going to be sensational Saturday well off the charts take it back up to the block Exactly. You know, we watch it slowly but surely build over the course of three days. You know, we talk about today being entry level, and we've seen a lot of fun cars sell for fun prices. We've also seen some solid cars bring good money. Tomorrow, well, the quality of the cars as well as the price of the cars is going to step up. And Super Saturday, well, it always delivers. $12,500, the current bid for a 2010 BMW 650i. And that's exactly what it sells for, $13,000. And away it goes to that gentleman right there, up in the skybox. 360 horsepower, six-speed, shiftable automatic transmission. Down to our final minutes of coverage of the Barrett-Jackson Collector Car Auction from Palm Beach on day one. We'll be right back with just a little bit more.
now back down to our final minute to the Barrett Jackson Collector Car Auction here on Thursday, the first day of our coverage. Remember, we have two more days tomorrow on FYI and Saturday on the History Channel. Up on the block right now, a 2013 Chevy Volt crossing the block. A real electric car that started off as an electric car. Yeah, and a real bargain of the current bid for what you have. In 2013, this was a very advanced vehicle that had an electric range, electric only of about 35, 38 miles, or you could have the normal generator or a motor to go even further if you wanted to go out of town. Um, this one is very important on these. When they get about 10 years old, the batteries can fail. I saw that this one has been replaced, so that's an important thing to check. This would make a great driver for someone. This is a hybrid, which means it has a little four-cylinder engine which can charge the battery. You don't have to plug it in and this picks up where the EV1 left off. The electric car program has come in fits and starts but I think it's here to stay finally now that we have six ton Hummers with electric thousand foot pounds. So I think electricity is kind of here to stay but here's one of those mid phase vehicles right here. Yeah I would say it's absolutely here to stay. Six thousand dollars the price for the 2013 Chevy Volt. Let's check out our top sellers for the day here on Thursday at Barrett Jackson in the third position. How about a Corvette? Now this one is from 1964 370 cubic inches 300 horsepower but the magic number 65,000 miles and it sold for fifty three thousand dollars. We had a tie at the top. Two cars selling for $60,000. One of them is Roadrunner, 383 V8, four-speed manual, $60,000. And it was tied with a 1965 Chevy Nova. That's right. This Roadrunner sold for the same price as this Nova. It had a 383 stroker engine. That color is gray pearl. When the hammer came down, it sold for $60,000. And that's just our first day here at Barrett-Jackson. Once again, we expect the numbers to go up every single day. Up on the block now, a 2009 Mitsubishi Eclipse GT. Now, Mitsubishi is one of those brands that may be on the endangered species list when it comes to car sales in the U.S., but in 2009, this was the last generation of the Eclipse. They had three of them in the U.S. The first one was iconic with the uh, Fast and Furious franchise used there. They had the second one, and then this is how it finished out. I think it was a really neat design. This is one of its best colors. Once again, though, we have a bra on the hood. You know, Tyler, to your point, I've been thinking that Mitsubishi is going to leave the United States for literally the last 10 years. Every year I look at the production numbers, I look at what they're doing, but I have to say they've, they've been coming out with some cool cars. I like what they're doing in terms of their styling, and maybe they're just hanging on by their fingertips, but they stay, and they've got some staying power. Beautiful paint on this one, but getting back to the point, Tyler, of the bra on the hood, we can see here that it does a good job of protecting from impacts, but it also likes to trap dust and moisture and becomes abrasive. You can see that line right there. Again, it's a mixed bag. They look cool, but sometimes can bite you where it counts. $6,500 for a 2009 Mitsubishi Eclipse. Up behind it, a 1993 Jeep Wrangler Custom. Well, this is the YJ generation of Jeep, easily distinguishable because of the uh, rectangular headlights. This one's been radically custom. It is ready to go off-road. Uh, definitely a major lift on this thing. 33 or 35-inch uh, off-road tires. Looks pretty mean. I will say the front axle on this is a Dana Model 30, and I do a little thing called the Junkyard Crawl on my YouTube channel. If you ever encounter a Volvo rear-wheel drive 240 with limited slip, grab it. You can put it in front of this thing and go rock crawling. A little junkyard tip for you. I have a 1994 that is mostly stock, except it was modified. It was a Sahara that was modified to look like the Jurassic Park Jeep. And I take the kids out, and they absolutely love it. But stock, it is still very capable off-road. I'm sure this one, even better. They removed the fenders so they don't get away for that, get in the way of the suspension articulation. Uh, of course, the light bar is pretty much a standard thing you have to do when you mod these. A lot of cool touches. The thing I love about Jeep is you can literally go anywhere in any of them. And this one, well, I mean, you are not going to get it stuck anywhere. You winch on the front will get you out, but it's just set up so well for anything. $19,500 for a custom 1993 Jeep Wrangler. All right, we've seen a number of Cadillac DeVilles rolling across the block from earlier from the 1970s. They were big, huge beasts, and now we got one from 1999, a little bit shorter. Well, well, it's large, it's American, it's a four-door, but it's a front-wheel drive car. You know, Cadillac was known for a body on frame, wheel drive cars, but this is strictly a V8 front-drive car. So it's big, but it's not what it looks like. 
Yes, this was actually the last car to be called the DeVille. Of course, they switched to the DTS after this, still continued the front wheel drive, North Star powered Cadillacs. But this is when the DeVille name actually left Cadillac. And only in America, this fake vinyl convertible type top with a fiberglass plug. <laughs> you know, and again, it's it, it's luxurious if you're over 50 like me. Well, I always wondered why they did the little snap-on things here, like they were attaching a boat cover to it. You know, they never baby. had it. It's all style. That North Star, it's a great engine, a 32-valve North Star, dual overhead cam, no push rods. So it's a high revving motor. Away it goes, and that's a wrap for day one from Barrett Jackson Palm Beach. But that was just a little taste of what's to come. We have 14 more hours of live auction action coming to you over the next two days, including seven hours on FYI tomorrow, starting at 11 o'clock Eastern time. The car lovers paradise. So for Mike Joy, Steve Magnante, Tyler Hoover, April Rose, and Christian Murphy, I'm Rick DeBrule. Thanks for riding along with us today. We'll see you back here tomorrow from the Sunshine State.